do have uh, one member that's running. Hopefully they'll be here shortly. Uh, so good evening, everybody. My name is Brad Farrell. I'm the chair of the Fish and Wildlife Board. Welcome to the February 2023 meeting. Um, first thing I want to do is ask uh, the board members to give themselves uh, and identify which county they are representing. Allison Frazier, Chittenden County. Burnham, Windsor County. Bob Patterson, Addison County. Neil Logan, Bennington County. Uh, Brad Brown, Caledonia County. Martin Van Buren, Baldwin County. Michael Bancroft, Orange County. Michael Colson from Essex County. Amy Dragon, Lamoille yeah. County. David Robillard from Orleans County. Uh, do we have anybody online? Brian, maybe? Yeah, Brian McCarthy, uh, Grand Isle County. Thank you. That was Brian McCarthy, Grand Isle County. Um, is that the volume, his volume or our volume, do you think? Okay, thank you, board members. Commissioner, uh, if you would like to take yourself and uh, the staff, you have to explain. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm Chris Herrick. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. We have a whole slew of Fish and Wildlife staff here tonight, and I guess we'll start with the Major and we'll work around this one. Hey, everybody. Sean Fowler, Major for the Warden Service. Hey, Good evening, Mark Scott for for Warhol. Josh Morris, Public Communication Officer. Catherine Guessing, General Counsel. David Sosville, Program Manager for Wildlife Management. Brian Furphy, Further Project Leader. Nick Fortin, Deer and Moose Project Leader. Katie Heater, Biometrician and Research Manager. Andrew Bowden, Monitor and Game Bird Project Leader. Okay. Uh, anybody online? Um, David Dean, Wyndham County. Welcome, David. Okay, thank you, Commissioner, and welcome all staff. Um, first item on our agenda tonight is approval of minutes. Uh, I know we got them late, so I'm not sure if everybody had a chance to, to review them. If anybody hasn't, and we can always put some approval to next month if we have to, but uh, unless I hear otherwise. I haven't had a chance to okay. fully look them over. So then we will move those to um, next month. We'll approve them next month. Okay, second item on the agenda is uh, public comments. Um, I have a list here of people who were signed up. I have at least nine or ten. Uh, public comments is limited to two minutes uh, per speaker. Uh, it's just uh, the opportunity for 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 non board members and non department members to speak and uh, share your thoughts with us on whatever that might be. I will attempt to identify your name here based on what I have in front of me. But please, when you're when you're speaking, if you could identify yourselves and which town you're from, that would be very helpful. Uh, so first I have uh, and Allison will be keeping time and notifying us when we reach the two minutes or as we're getting close. Uh, the first individual is from uh, Moncton, and I think it's Bev. Yep, yep Bev, so I checked Moncton, Vermont. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you guys for letting us all speak and be here. Um, we have some very important topics this evening, and I hope everyone keeps an open mind. Um, Rod has great experience and a lot of info for you this evening. Um, when we discuss the wolves, the apex predators, they're a very important role in our ecosystems. And they can help us control the populations of some of the other conflict species that we have issues with. Very similar to how the coyotes helped control deer herds and made them healthier. Um, I personally believe that these apex creatures are already passing through, and I think education is going to be key, and it's going to be very um, meaningful and respectful to have coexistence with them. Um, this is one of the instances where I agree with everyone when they say we should let nature take its course. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next individual, Ann. Good evening, Chair and Board. Uh, my name is Ann Jameson. I'm from Marshfield. I am the Wildlife Traffic Chief for the Mountain Range flies and snow limited and in between seasons for trade. It's for deer, for moose, bear, lots of fish. Coyotes, 
As was determined from the Coyote Hill in New York State in 22, the Eastern Coyote does indeed share wolf DNA, sometimes a large percentage. Based on morphology and limited DNA data to these animals taken in 98, 06, 13, at least two and likely three of the so termed coyotes killed in Iran were wolves. Since there is little data on the percentage of wolf DNA in the Mons Eastern Coyote, it's very possible that some number of coyotes taken, or some number of coyotes taken, hunters are actually related to and is an ESA protected species. It is extremely important that procedures and regulations for monitoring coyotes be established so that wolves are not killed by mistake. In order to facilitate this, a regulated limited quarry coyote season, preferably October 1st to December 1st, should be established. Check in requirements for all candidates must be established and monitored, similar to the procedures for deer. DNA analysis to assess the genetic composition of checked in animals, which meet certain regulatory criteria regarding size, weight, head and ear size, should be performed, documented, and saved thereby providing a definitive method of identifying wolves when taken. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, next on our list is Rod Arnado. Hi. Good evening, members of the board, commissioner and the department. Uh, my name is Rod Coronado, and I'm a resident of the town of Orange. I'm also here representing Vermont Wolf Patrol. Uh, so the art group was started nine years ago specifically to address conflicts with wolves. And uh, in the eight years I've been working on that issue, I found that most of them are resolvable and preventable. Um, over the years, I've been many, in many rooms like this where there's a huge divide between two groups who are passionate about wildlife. And I like the quote by Aldo Leopold from the last board meeting that it's not a human problem, it's a wildlife problem. Or it is a human problem, it's not a wildlife problem. Uh, the recent survey of Vermonter attitudes towards fur bearers shows overwhelming support for the restoration of native species. 91% of those surveys supported such efforts. Restoring the wolf to Vermont is a project that all sides in the wildlife debate should stand behind because it will help restore the ecological balance created when the wolves were first eradicated and other predators as well. Currently, VTrans, for example, spends hundreds of thousands of dollars every year on addressing infrastructure threats due to beaver activity. Uh, restoring a principal natural predator of beavers to Vermont will help hopefully help address this issue. I've read the department's response to the Wolf Coalition petition, and I support the department's commitment to the recovery of extirpated species. Our organization believes that wolf recovery in Vermont should be an issue that brings opposing forces together for the collective interests of all of our state's wildlife. How cool is that? Uh, we stand ready to assist the department with its identified goals for wolf recovery in Vermont. We strongly believe that all stakeholders helping to build stronger social caring capacity for wolves and other predators with educational resources is the first step to wolf recovery everywhere. Uh, everyone in this room has the opportunity to be a part of Vermont history by bringing the wolf back to Vermont. And I respectfully would like to ask that we, uh, or that the department establish a working group uh, to bring together these stakeholders to contribute to the recovery work outlined in the department's response. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next on the list, I have Nancy Fitzpatrick. Oh, no, I didn't speak. No, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, next on the list, I have Charles Palmer. No. Okay. Um, Brent Gadaby. No. Okay. Uh, Garrett Henderson. No. Okay, that's quick. Uh, Bob Galvin. Yes. <laughs> Hello, board members and commissioner. My name is Bob Galvin, and I'm a resident of Richmond, Vermont. And I'm here representing Animal Wellness Action, a animal protection group that has over 700 supporters in Vermont. I just wanted to introduce myself to the board and give a little bit of background as to myself and the information that I bring to protecting wildlife in Vermont. So prior to moving to Vermont, I worked for seven years conducting wildlife research across the United States, studying bird behavior and ecology in Texas, Delaware, Oregon, Arizona, 
Virginia, New Mexico, and Pennsylvania. I have a master's of science in biology with a concentration in ecology and evolutionary biology. And I say this to reinforce the commitment that myself and my organization has towards propagating the best science and working with the department in order to make sure the best science is used in Vermont. Uh, I think there's also a significant ethical dimension to the questions that we are dealing with in wildlife management. Uh, questions like, should the Fish and Wildlife Board be represented by stakeholder groups other than hunters, fishers, and trappers? Uh, is an, are important questions, questions like are Vermonters willing to coexist with wolves in the future? These are questions that are ethical questions, are questions of value, and that really needs to be considered when making these decisions. Uh, that's all that I have for this evening. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, next on the list, I have Sarah Gorsland. Yeah, I'm Sarah Gorsland. I'm down here in Grand Isle. Um, as many of you know, I'm also with the National uh, Science Based Organization Project Coyote. Um, we advocate for the uh, non lethal uh, coexistence strategy with native carnivores, and we also offer a bunch of cost saving measures and practical solutions for challenging farmers to deal with wildlife conflict. Uh, I'm here today to speak in support of the Northeast Wolf Recovery Alliance petition that's before the board. Um, we, uh, at Project Coyote from our Science Advisory Board, we know that wolves and coyotes are key apex predators in our native ecosystems. They help regulate many other species within the ecosystems, so they're incredibly important. Um, I see these measures in this petition as baby steps um, to start establishing whether a federally protected species is um, how present it is in the state and how many of these animals are being killed, how we can better protect them so that they are a federally protected species. We know that um, based on a public records request that since 1998, there have been, um, as um, this woman mentioned, there have been two um, wolves killed um, that have verified wolf DNA, um, possibly a third up in uh, North Hero. Um, so we know that these animals are here already. And um, our question to the board is, how are you therefore going to protect them how are you going to bring your wildlife policy into line with modern science to protect these animals that we know are already in Vermont? So I look forward to working with the board towards that um, goal together. Um, if anyone needs information, Project Coyote has a science advisory board packed full of people who have studied these animals for decades. They're highly trained. They know all about wolves and coyotes. So any info you need, um, please come to us. We're happy to share. I also just wanted to say that as a citizen and as a human being, I would like to see personally a moratorium on canid hunting period. Um, my understanding through science is this. Okay, thank you. Appreciate the time. Thank you. That's all I have on my list. Is anybody else um, on in the room? But can we go online? Either one of the individuals want to say anybody else that I missed? Or that's okay. Uh, we have somebody online who wants to. Uh, so the first one in the list is Reedy Sinclair. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? <laughs> hear you if you speak loudly. Okay, I apologize for the barking uh, dog, but um, so yeah, thank you for the opportunity to testify this evening. My name is Renee Secor. I'm the carnivore conservation advocate for Project Coyote and the Rewilding Institute. So I'm speaking today on behalf of our Vermont members, as well as the Northeast Wolf Recovery Alliance, including Vermont affili affiliate groups, who sent in the letter that has now become a, peti a petition before the board. Our main concern on this petition is the inevitability of wolves to be dispersing into Vermont and the current lack of hunting regulations and reporting requirements for wild canids. As Vermont Fish and Wildlife detailed in their 2015 State Wildlife Action Plan, the ability of coyote hunters in the Northeast to effectively discern, discern wolves from coyotes in the field will be a major influence on the likelihood of natural wolf recolonization. So in order to reach a middle ground between complete legal protections for all wild canids and current regulations which allow for an open season, 
We asked the department to amend its regulations to institute the following protective procedures, what can be, which can be seen outlined in our letter, including establishing a limited hunting season with bag limits, a requirement that hunters check in cadence they kill in order to provide needed data on the numbers, sizes, and characteristics of wild canids, as well as DNA analysis of checked in canids meeting certain criteria, which will provide critical data to help identify if wolves have been taken. Your department and your 25, 2015 State Wildlife Action Plan specifically stated a goal was to evaluate Vermont large canid ancestry and by DNA analysis and morphology to monitor the possibility of recolonization. So you stated that you would obtain tissue samples and morphological measurements of large canids killed or otherwise observed in Vermont. From our public records request, it appears that the agency has not done this yet. And from these recommendations, these recommendations in our letter would assist with that reaching that that your own goal. So without these measures, Vermont Fish and Wildlife, in our opinion, is failing to implement their 2015 State Wildlife Action Plan, as well as neglecting the duties to protect federally and state protected ecologically valuable wolves. So That's additional that. protective. Okay, thank you. Next on the list is Brian O'Gorman. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So listen, uh, I just want to tell you that according to your uh, Vermont uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, website that uh, trappers and hunters and anglers uh, through their licensees have paid for the wildlife management uh, areas. And um, I've been reading that uh, people uh, about this trap setback, you know, traps setback uh, is a solution for a non-existent problem. Now we have a lot of Vermonters that uh, prepare the traps. They've had their traps. They might've been inherited from their grandfather or somebody back in the 1900s, but that doesn't matter. They could have bought them online. They die, they wax them, they fix them, they run a trap line. They get out there and they skin and prepare their pelts. They dry them and they send them to market. I don't think any of these antis have run a trap line in their life. And I'd like to know also when the coyote hounding moratorium is going to expire. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Next on the list is James Fitzwilliam. Make sure you're, you take your mute off, Jane. How about now? You're good. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm Jane Fitzwilliam from Putney, and I represent Vermont Coyote Coexistence Coalition. Almost a year ago, on March 21st, 2022, our coalition sent Commissioner Herrick a petition for a regulated coyote hunting season. And this actually is directed to you, Commissioner Herrick. So far, you've not responded. And even in the last few weeks, I've sent you a email strings asking when a regulated hunting season will be brought up for discussion. And this petition dovetails nicely with the petition we're discussing tonight. You'd agreed that any discussion needed de deliberation and that such a discussion would merit your time and effort and you said, let's have that discussion. Biologist Royer said she also supported a conversation around it, the establishment of a coyote season. Our science-based petition was reviewed by the relevant natural resources, House and Senate committees. Vermont Coyote and our supporters would like a timelier response to this petition Almost a year has passed since we sent it to you and the House and Senate committees. When will you respond? Thank you. Does anyone else online want to speak? If you do either raise your hand or unmute yourself and say, I do. Okay, 
not seeing any other hands or hearing any other voices. Uh, thank you for everybody for your public comments. Um, we will take everything in consideration as we move forward. And um, this, there were a lot of questions about when are we going to discuss, you know, hunting seasons or if there's going to be a closed season on uh, coyotes. We will be seeing those tentatively. We are scheduled to see a lot of that information next month in the month of March, where the department will be uh, coming forward and, and proposing uh, initially, at least to the board, um, everything they've been working on for the past year and the proposal around trapping and uh, potentially higher seasons and whatnot. But everything they've been asked to work for, we're going to be discussing next month. So just as an FYI. Um, okay, next item on the agenda is the um, Wolf Coalition petition on, on um, from uh, the North East Wolf Recovery Alliance. So that was in the form of a letter to the department. Um, the bottom of that letter. I don't know if the department wants to, to, to speak to that letter or speak to the petition at all. And, um, like I said, if everybody here has the opportunity to read it or at least see it, everybody receives it. So um, before we speak to that or take any action on that, uh, the department wants to um, Commissioner speak to the starting sure. to that. Everybody request. should have it uh, packaged and handed out. Um, and I'll ask uh, Director Scott to address it. Oh, uh, I glad we got it. It's timely. Um, that's, that's the letter we got from. So we have, as you would think you heard tonight, there's some existing petitions on the same subject. So as you are going to share next month, for the next you, um, with our thoughts on making any changes on further enhancements that we want, that includes the entire county, um, that includes trapping, um, as the best management practices that we've been directed to do it. So that's where we are on. So I, I would, if there's any action that the board would take tonight, I would ask them to um, table the petition and ask the department to work the information that the petition to our management. Welcome to the petition. Okay, so just so I understand, so based on, you know, the request that came through the petition, um, the department's requesting that we, at this point, <laughs> the board give the department a chance to look at it and incorporate any recommended changes they're going to make into the recommendations that they're possibly going to put forth next month. Okay. Here we go. Could I ask that uh, you move closer to a micro uh, a, uh, a microphone? This is an important conversation. I'm sorry, I'm talking to uh, Mark. Um, here. Okay. Can you hear me from here? Uh, yeah, the board is okay. fine. I yeah. can't. Okay, I just want to let you know, the people that are listening online, our response is we welcome the petition. Uh, we will, and, and your chair said it way better than I articulated it. Thank you, uh, Brad. But we, we have a couple petitions and interest from people to look at all regulations currently on the books for coyote hunting um, here in the state of Vermont. So we were, we're looking at that right now. I'm going to come back to the members here, the board in March. Um, I'm not sure, you know, the, it's tentative on the schedule whether the board can do a vote or not. But we've got a lot of ground to cover between the current work that's been done on best management practices for trapping um, and the coyote hunting with dogs and also interest from people in the state of Vermont to have a closed season, everything from a couple months to two years on coyote hunting. So. We're, we're going to come back and address that with the board in March and most likely it'll carry over in April. So did you, were you able to hear that folks online? Yes, I, I did hear that. Thanks okay. for uh, speaking Thanks for up. Thanks for bringing here. it up. Huh? Yep. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could comment. Sure, Dave. Um, as I read the, the letter, I, I, there are, or the memo, there are items that deal with wolves individually, and in particular, um, that um, 
there be some kind of testing to try and establish whether or not a wolf strain population exists within the state. And I don't see that as becoming part of a report on coyotes, unless I misread how the department would react to that. And I'm just anxious that um, uh, we get some idea or put something in motion that will give us an idea of whether there is a population within the state, a wolf population in the state. We certainly know there are coyotes. <laughs> um, so if that is incorporated in terms of uh, what was intended in those remarks, then I'm satisfied. But if wolf and testing for that gets left out, then I would like to bring that up as a separate issue. We're going to address all the issues. Uh, the answer from the uh, department to, to your question is that all will be addressed in the recommendations that we hear next week. Next, excuse me, next month. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from um, Jamie? I just have a question. I would just like to invite Sarah to send us the information that you have um, via Wolf so that we can have a greater understanding of the issue. Um, I think that would be helpful just going forward. Thank you. Any other board members have any questions this week, tonight on this issue? Okay, if someone uh, wants to make a motion that we um, that we do forward the, um, the petition as presented to the department and have them um, incorporate in their presentation next month. Take a vote on that. So moved. A second. Second. Okay. All those in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Extensions. Okay. Ayes have it. Thank you. Okay. Item number four: Migratory game bird season preview. Commissioner, yeah. I'm going to ask David, are you going to lead this discussion? I'm going to introduce the person that is going to lead that. Great, I like that. Pick it off for David. I guess Mark is going to lead the discussion. Right. It's going to lead into David yeah. leading a discussion. You get me just to be quiet. Uh, uh, I said, I'm going to maybe stand back here so that folks hear me. Oh, too virtually. I hate to put my back to some people. It's all right. It's all right. Not that I don't trust you. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you. Uh, so I, I feel it's important for that we have a lot of new board members here relatively, um, at least since we were looking at waterfall migratory birds at this time, about this time last year. Um, so I've asked uh, David, who's been that project leader for a long time, to work with our new waterfall migratory bird project leader to walk you through the entire process. Um, it's significant. It affects a lot of different species here that come in Vermont at, at different times. But I also think it's important that for the new board members um, that you understand a little background on these people. Um, David's been with the department, I think, 23 years, if my math's right, maybe more. And please correct me if I'm a little bit wrong. But um, I first got to meet David when I was directing the conservation camp program, and he came to work to us um, down at the Keogh Conservation Camp. At that time, it was just Lake Bombazine Camp as a, a summer intern who was getting his education um, at the University of Vermont. So. David spent two summers down there. I think some of you um, still know Kevin Lawrence, a previous board chair. Um, Kevin was the director at that time uh, down, down there at the camp when David worked. But he's uh, been with the department 20 years, worked at Dead Creek, uh, one of our premier waterfall birding destinations um, here in New England. I can probably say that now we have taken the residents in recent years, turned it into a full-time visitor center um, where people can learn and enjoy about um, work the department does as well as waterfall. David also comes with a background of working for Ducks Unlimited, a private conservation organization whose mission is to protect, actually purchase, protect, and manage wetlands throughout North America. Um, and he's also has spent time in land stewardship working for Virginia Fish and Game. Um, so like most Vermonters that I know that want to work here for the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, it's, you just don't walk into that job when you come out of school. And David followed that route with several years working with different organizations to build up his, his skills and abilities. And 
I lose track of time, but maybe are we going on two years that you've accepted, one to two years of the current responsibility where he oversees all those species that are hunted um, in trap um, for the department, his staff. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to him and I, I will just say that uh, nothing does me prouder than that a Vermonter who grew up in Bennington, Vermont, still has family in that age, can go to college, um, go away for many years and be able to come back to where he wants to work. I think it's a, it's a real testament to people who are able to do that because the jobs are very hard to get and they're very competitive. But Dave, I'm gonna turn over to you to, to walk through this and um, introduce our new person again too. Be a little closer to the speaker too. Yeah. Also gonna start off just introducing uh, Brian Furphy. He's, our, as you said, our new fur bear biologist. I didn't want that to get lost in the, the mix, but uh, Bree's been on with us for just over two weeks now. So she's really kind of getting into it and we're just dumping all types of uh, issues and uh, information on top of her. Uh, she came to us from Oregon. Uh, she was a district biologist out there. She worked with uh, everything from mountain lions to wolves and livestock issues, elk, uh, mule and white-tailed deer. She began her career, uh, she acquired an associate's degree in marine biology and ecology down in Florida. Then she went on for a BA in ecology and conservation management, uh, Evergreen College out in the state of Washington. Then she received her master's in avian ecology with black skimmers from Arcan Arkansas State University. Uh, as I said, she uh, she's worked a lot with non-game birds in Kentucky and then also in Florida with bear conflicts with humans and uh, everything from hogs and pythons to small games. So she comes to us with a, a varied background and from, uh, as we say, she's getting a lot of experience in many different areas. So we wanted to welcome Bree and uh, just make sure you, know, if you can introduce yourselves during the break, I think would be great and to welcome her to the state. And then Andrew, who's over here in the corner. Um, Andrew is with us for just about six weeks now. So we have a lot of new staff coming on in the section. He's out of the Exit Junction office. He took over as project leader for the migratory game bird section. I came to us after being away for about 13, 14 years. He actually grew up in New Haven, Vermont. So he's another returning person similar to what the route I took. Uh, has a BS in wildlife biology from the University of Montana. Then he went on for his master's in uh, Western Illinois University studying SCA. And has uh, his background is very heavy in waterfowl from around the, the country. He's worked in uh, states that from uh, North Dakota, Virginia, uh, Minnesota, Mississippi, and Nevada. So he's seen a lot of the United States also. He came to us from um, North Dakota, worked at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service out there in the Wetlands Management District, where he oversaw uh, conservation easements and protection and dealt with the landowners, private landowners that had the easements on their property. He did a lot with disease monitoring and also with what they call it their WPAs, waterfowl production areas, a lot of wetland in the areas that were purchased the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service. And then his, his history, as I said, is focused on waterfowl management, but he also has experience with bats, a lot of reptiles and amphibians, and then also dealing with invasive plant control. So I just wanna welcome Andrew up here. We threw him right into it and asked him to do the presentation this year. And uh, we told him we'd help him out where, uh, where he doesn't have the experience yet, so. I'm going to try to move this. Probably going to be over here because that is tied into the leg of that unit. Is that one easier? The other one? There's one here. All right. So thank you for having me. Um, <coughs> Migratory game birds are managed on a flyway level. Um, um, so right now we're in the Atlantic flyway, which is the 17 Eastern states and the Eastern Canadian provinces. And migratory game birds are surveyed in two main survey surveys, the Atlantic flyway breeding waterfowl survey area, which is the Northeastern US without Maine. And then the Eastern survey area, which is the Eastern Canadian provinces. And that's the more traditional uh, survey area, um, which is done by air. And the uh, Eastern or the Atlantic Flyway Breeding Waterfowl Survey is done by ground. Um, so duck, uh, 
And most of the surveys were reinstituted this uh, in 2022 for the first time since 2019. Um, breeding habitat conditions ranged from fair to excellent. Um, it's a big range, but it's a very large survey area. So habitat can uh, vary across the area. Um, mallard breeding populations in the Atlantic Flyway uh, increased by 15% since the 2019 surveys, but they're still about 3% below the long-term average. Um, and total duck breeding population across the country uh, increased by 9% from 2019 and still is hovering around the long-term average. Um, so right now, or based on the 22 surveys, um, there were about 34.2 million uh, ducks across the country, um, which and you can see it's right just below the long-term average. This was the dashed line. Uh, estimated wood duck breeding population within Vermont in 2022 was 6, 000, around 6,800, um, and mallard breeding population was around 19,600. Um, banning efforts for resident geese estimated that resident goose populations were down a little bit. It was they did not catch very many or not a uh, normal amount. Um, and there was good brood rearing habitat early on in the spring, but those uh, that cover began to decline as uh, water conditions decreased due to drought. Um, and fall duck banding was difficult due to those low water levels. Uh, resident Canada goose pairs um, were around uh, 11,000, um, which is below the uh, peak from 2013 to 2016, um, but still matches up with the trend line and is around uh, our target population of around 10,000 breeding pairs. Uh, Canada, goose, Canada goose seasons are managed in two main zones. Um, the Atlantic population zone, which breed up on the Ngaba Peninsula and Vermont is in that zone. Um, and then the North Atlantic population zone, which breeds up in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador um, and New Hampshire falls into that zone. The St. James or Southern James Bay population is no longer being considered as a distinct population. It's now being uh, lumped into the Atlantic population zone. Um, so the green there in Virginia and Pennsylvania um, is going to be going away and those are going to become resident resident Canada goose zones. Um, so the Atlanta population of Canada goose breeding pairs is back up from 2019. Um, I believe it's around 164,000 um, was the latest estimate. Um, and that's right in line with the, I mean, besides the 2019 surveys, 2018, 2019 surveys, uh, right in line with the trend line of staying pretty consistent around 160 to 107,000 pairs. Um, so waterfowl hunting in Vermont um, is a very loyal following. So there's uh, Vermont duck stamp sales have stayed relatively consistent for the last 10 years, around 6,000. Um, and don't have the 22 numbers yet for all the metrics, but uh, number of active duck hunters has remained consistent around two to 3,000 for the last 10 years as well. Um, and this information is all acquired through uh, the Harvest Information Program or the HIP program. So every waterfowl hunter has to register with the HIP, with HIP to, uh, and by registering for a HIP number, they are asked a series of questions that uh, ask how many days they hunted or how many species or how many ducks they killed the year before, how many geese they killed the year before. Um, and that along with the parts collection survey, which asked hunters to collect a wing off of a duck or a or tail feathers off of a goose and send them into the uh, hotaxant in Maryland for analysis. Um, with those numbers is how we determine the number of ducks killed or estimates of the number of ducks killed and the number of active hunters. Um, so our proposed, uh, we have two controlled hunt areas in Vermont. Uh, Mud Creek, our proposed days are 
Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And then Dead Creek or will be Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and Friday, October 20th, that should be the 20th. Um, and those stay consistent from previous years, same days. Um, so our Vermont is broken into three waterfowl hunting zones, the Champlain zone, which covers both Vermont and New York. Um, and the interior of Vermont zone, oh, and Vermont controls this season setting for the Lake Champlain zone, uh, the interior of Vermont zone, and then the Connecticut River zone, which is set by New Hampshire. Uh, so the we can change zones and splits every five years. Um, and right now, our next option to uh, update zones or change zones is in, will be in 2025. Um, so right now we are uh, in the, so the final season frameworks have just been released. Um, so this is a timeline of the season setting process. Um, so right now we're close to the bottom. Um, all seasons, all season selections have to be into the Fish and Wildlife Service by April 30th. Um, and in another week, I'll be traveling down to Georgia for the Atlantic Flyway Technical Section meeting to start uh, looking at data and uh, numbers on and, rec and making recommendations for uh, the 2024 seasons to the Atlantic Flyway Council. Um, so our September Canada goose hunting seasons uh, recommendations are. <clears throat> So there's the framework, federal frameworks allow for 25 days between September 1st and September 25th, and up to a 15 bird bag limit, daily bag limit. Our recommendations are to hold the season from September 1st to the 25th and have it be an eight goose per day bag limit. Uh, and then the, in the Connecticut River zone, they're made by statute the, that they, they would have to change statute to increase from five up to eight, so they are still at five birds per day. Uh, our youth waterfowl days, our recommendation is to hold that September 23rd and 24th, um, which does overlap with the Canada goose early resident season. Our woodcock season recommendations are to start on September 23rd and run through November 6th. Uh, federal frameworks allow us to have a 45 day season uh, that can start as early as September 13th. Um, we have and our daily bag limit of three. Um, we set it at or recommend it to start at sep on September 23rd because that's the start of our grouse and small game seasons. Uh, we recommend that snipe seasons uh, run concurrent with uh, woodcock season. Um, September 23rd to the 6th and a daily bag limit of eight. Um, we do have 107 days available for snipe, but uh, they're very difficult to tell apart from woodcock. Uh, so right now we're in, in the middle of a uh, long-term woodcock study on migration and nesting. Um, and this is a map showing some of the uh, woodcock uh, migration routes um, that were tagged in Vermont. Some have gone all the way down into Mississippi and Alabama. Uh, so our duck hunting season recommendations, um, we have 60 days that we can are allotted between September 23rd and January 31st with a daily bag limit of six. Our uh, recommendations are uh, for the interior of Vermont zone are October 14th to December 12th, uh, running straight through. And then the Lake Champlain zone is split into two uh, segments, October 14th to the 18th, and then October 28th to December 21st. Um, the Connect River zone again is set by New Hampshire, so we don't have recommendations from them yet. Um, and within the uh, this year, the flyway count has recommended an increase from two mallards to four mallards per day, uh, and up to two hens. Um, and then there are 
Um, that's letters changed this year. No, it's a, a aggregate bag of three. And then there are four up to four sea ducks, which can be containing only three at most three of any of the sea duck species, which we don't get very many through Vermont. Our mergans are any seasons. We recommend coinciding with the uh, duck seasons, and that should be a six bird bag limit or a five bird bag limit, not a six bird bag limit. Um, uh, so our Atlantic population, Canada goose seasons, or the migratory population um, is increased, or the recommendations are to increase it from a 30 day season and a one day, one bird per day bag limit uh, the past two or three years up to a 45 day season and a limit of three per day. Um, our recommendation is to hold that season from October 14th to November 27th. Uh, and <clears throat> in looking at band recoveries, it shows that our, the Atlantic population uh, geese primarily migrate through Vermont. Mm -hmm. And so this allows this allowed for a uh, this allowed for a special late resident season um, to the experimental season to be proposed, um, which this year was the first year, um, and next year will be the second year of this experimental uh, season. And the federal framework allows for 77 days in that experimental season. Um, between December 1st and February 15th, and the daily bag limit of five. Our proposed season is to run from December 1st to January 6th with a five day bird bag limit, five bird per day bag limit. Um, and this, uh, that's as you can see, that's not 77 days. Um, so this comes down to federal framework only allows for 107 days uh, total of a single species or a uh, combined species. So the 37 days uh, between December 1st and January 6th is the remaining 37 days within that 107 days uh, after the early resident season and then the migratory season. Um, so the snow goose season, uh, season federal framework allows for 107 days between October 1st and March 10th. Uh, with a daily bag limit of 25 birds per day. Um, our proposed seasons uh, run from October 1st to December 31st, and then starting again in February 24th to March 10th. And then there's a special conservation order, which uh, starts, which we're proposing to start March 11th and run into April 26th, which is right before youth turkey season. Um, and that, the bag limit for the conservation order is 15 per day, and the uh, bag limit for the regular season is 25 per day. Uh, grant recommendations <laughs> are going down from 2021, 2022, um, to a uh, recommended 30 day uh, season and or a federal framework allows for 30 days and a one bird bag limit. Um, and our recommendation is to go from October 14th to November 12th. Um, falconry seasons coincide with whatever migratory uh, game bird seasons are running, um, and they're limited to three birds per day. Uh, we made a lot of these recommendations based on uh, different data. Um, this comes from eBird, um, and it shows that there's a peak of duck abundance um, in mid to late October. And then also another peak um, in late November and early December. Um, so early migrating babbling duck species um, generally peak in uh, mid to late October um, and then decline throughout the rest of the year. Diving duck species generally uh, peak in December. Um, with uh, Scott peaking prior to that in late October and early November, but the golden eye generally come through uh, in early to mid December and later. Yeah. 
Um, so Vermont Dog Stamp Fund, um, established in 1985, um, the first duck stamp in 1986. Um, it's raised over six million dollars. Um, we spent over three million dollars on projects on, uh, and those current balance numbers are not accurate. We're not able to get the most up to date numbers for this. Um, and it's we've completed over 99 projects on over 12,000 acres with that fund. Uh, so the waterfowl stamp sales have stayed very consistent over the last 30 years um, after the initial uh, high numbers for collectors and first of state uh, buyers. Um, so the next steps are for the board to make a straw vote on whether to move forward on accepting the recommendations um, and then uh, we'll start hosting public meetings, which are scheduled for uh, Ticonderoga on March 14th and then Essex office on March 16th. Uh, we'll hold the public hearings uh, and then the board will make a final vote on the approval of the seasons uh, in April and the uh, Season selections are due to the Fish and Wildlife Service by April 30th. To jump in a room, it's technical, but the board and the department don't have to go through a rulemaking process to set the bag limits and season dates for waterfall and migratory bird hunting in Vermont. It's through what we call a procedure. It's the same procedure that we go through on issuing moose hunting permits and also antlerless deer hunting in the state. So I'll just so you you're off the hook the first year to do <laughs> But uh, anyway, I don't want to confuse folks because we will be going through a rulemaking process on amending the fur bear regulations. That you'll be starting that work in a little more detail in March. Thank you. I have a question. On, on table seven, um, it talks about the and the, and the different seasons, 170 days in July. And yet the first one, the resident, 25 days, September 1st to February 25th. Second one is 45 days, which is regular. The third one again is the resident. Can you again tell me the difference between resident and regular? What are the different goals between those? So the uh what table is that again? Page seven, seven. Page 16. Yes, 16. So the early resident season is to target uh, birds that are here locally and breed here locally. Um, and then the regular season is the migratory season. So that's when the Atlantic population is migrating through. Um, and then the resident Late season um, is to target the geese that stick around here all winter, basically. Can you explain, Andrew, a little bit, given we have some new board members here, or David chime in too? How do we know, as, as biologists or scientists, whether the bird is, quote, a resident bird or that, that, that breeds here? They may take off for a while, but they're going to get back that first a migratory candidate group. So there, there's entirely different populations. So I don't want to put you up a spot, but uh, David will back you up. Yeah. Uh, that all comes from, or largely comes from banding data. Um, so the they band up on the Ungava Peninsula um, pretty much every year, except for the last few years due to COVID. So with those uh, banding returns, band returns, the birds, they can tell when the birds are moving through. Um, and then we also ban locally here our resident Canada geese that breed here um, every summer around late June and early July to uh, get an estimate of uh, hatch success or nesting success um, and as well as uh, sex ratios and uh, age estimates, age, age ratios. One, one thing historically that I'll pop in there. I think it was back in the 90s. Uh, 
they did a net collar study also, both from the Angaba birds and resident birds. So folks were going around from October through December, looking at the collars, reporting which which group of birds were here to document that on top of the, the leg bands that were recovered during the hunting season. So if a hunter takes a bird <clears throat> during the October, during the regular season, the migratory birds, are they actually looking at a band or are they just taking the bird and then figuring out what band that it's on the bird? You mean, are people targeting bands? I, how do they know they're taking a migratory bird? Yeah. Not a bird. Yeah. I'm not, if I'm not a bird hunter, so I, I'm just not sure how they, they don't know. So you get it. You don't. Okay. Yeah. So they get really good eyes. <laughs> they all gen, they all look the same, uh, the same, even down to subspecies. I think. Yeah. yeah, pretty much down to subspecies. They're all technically the same, um, but the uh, the goose colonies up in the up in the Ungava were not doing well uh, in that 2019 time frame, um, but they've since bounced back. In the most recent surveys um and so it the hunter doesn't know it's not until the band is sent in and we get a uh, report of where that band was banned where the bird was banded and where it was harvested um so that you can look at the time frame or look at the band recoveries and see as they move through where they were being harvested throughout the stakes Mr. Chair, what board members, one of the very unique in the science behind this waterfall migratory game bird hunting is if you recall where Andrew mentioned, where are you going next month? Or, uh, Georgia. Georgia to work with his peers on all the different states in the flyway to look at the data, to look at the science and make sure they're all in sync, contributing to the capturing of birds, the banding, aging, sexing birds, doing field service. So unlike um, us managing Vermont's deer population, we're doing that just ourselves. Not to say the scientists aren't working across state boundaries on issues and making sure the methods we're using are also in sync with where the profession is on population modeling. But it's an incredible blend of different scientists from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and all the state agencies, and sometimes private conservation organizations and university people that are coming together to to look at this information because the number one goal like we have on moose or deer is to have a sustained healthy population of these birds and they're actually looking out to do that and what was tough on I many states is when we had that hiccup of COVID where it, it limited the ability of, of the biologists to get out there and do on the ground work usually some of our staff will even go up and volunteer to help Canada on the nesting grounds or vice versa but is there anything else that picture you want to add, Dave? But, but it really impressed me when I when I saw how much work they're all doing. I think probably I would just expand on the calendar of events, how it goes for the flyway. As Andrew said, in February we're going down to, to meet and just start discussing 2024 information because they don't do it with current year data. They have the models they use three to four years of running data. So at the same time, we're studying 2023 seasons. And then getting it into the federal register by April and May. Then we started doing the spring surveys, all the green pair counts, the nest ground surveys. Uh, the, they're looking at the tail and heart survey, so looking at by species, the harvest levels. Then those reports start coming out in June and July. We'll have another meeting in usually August, September, make final recommendations. And after both of those technical section meetings, it goes to the federal government, what they call the Service Regulatory Committee. That's where all four flyways get together and we present our, our recommendations to them. They review it on a, a, a larger scale basis. And then the options come out to us. They're supposed to be out to us in December. Usually it's January, February, just because of the process that they have to go through for review internally. And then that's when it starts with us. We bring the presentation to the board. We go out to the, the public and then bring the final votes ahead and it just starts all over again and it's just a constant process of basically they call it double looping you're looking at the current data you're bringing it back in you're seeing it needs to be modified the surveys and the, the, the models that they have and they're constantly reviewing to see if there's habitat changes and population changes for any concern so it's a very active process Kevin, uh the geese that were covered up in uh Crystal Lake, 
the avionic flu was what it came back as on the Super Bowl. Correct. That was avian influenza, a uh, high path variety of it. Was it migratory? Whatever it was. We didn't have any that were banded. Uh, that was December, I think, that they were, that we collected those. So those were likely resident birds that had not moved off into, usually where the main majority of resident birds in December, Lake Champlain, where there's open water, or Memphis Magog at times. Right. And then with the way this year has been very unusually warm, birds will actually do short migration. So like the birds that leave us go down usually into Massachusetts, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. They will bounce back sometimes when conditions that we have right now, we may see birds come back and then if conditions go back into winter, they'll, they'll fly as far south as the snow line is. Other question. Has there been a an increase in population of our resident birds um, over the years, over the last 10, 15 years? It just seems anecdotally that there are a lot more geese on you know, public beaches and places where we didn't used to see them. Yeah, and uh, there's a certain these word nuisance component to it, but there is. Yeah, and uh, so I don't know if that's if that's really an issue or not. Yeah, so there has been an increase over the last ten years, but it has now decreased since that uh, spike in 2013 to 2016. Um, this one? No, up one more. Well, there too. Yeah, and the um, there was a spike between 2013 and 2015 ish, um, and right now the population is uh, below that spike. It's hovering around 11,000. But since uh, banning or since these estimates kind of first started in the early 90s, late 80s, after uh, populations got established, um, it has been a steady trajectory uh, upwards. Um, but there, right now we don't, since we don't have a couple of years of banning data, we don't know what the trend is currently, um, but it is below that peak um, and hopefully we can get it to stay consistently around there because our set target is around 10,000 pairs. I just wanted to add part of this. The goal is to drop them down the local birds because of the human conflict issues. And the early resident season was targeting that. And until last year when they allowed us the experimental season along with Connecticut, Massachusetts, we're targeting those same birds in December because the migrants had moved through. And those birds are also going on to like the Lake Champlain and Memphis Magog, so they they can focus on resident birds. But yes, those many of the human conflict areas are in urban areas, the beaches where they don't like the the feces on the beach for some reason, the water quality issues, and uh, so it's they're often in areas where you cannot address that with hunting in those particular areas, and that's where that fit or. December season helps December, January, because those birds leave the interior areas when it, when it freezes up and goes out into the open water area. So you can actually target those birds. Another question on the avian flu. The, uh, does that transcend through all bird species, specifically the wild turkey? I got a uh, email earlier in the year and there was a turkey up in our area that had a lot of like swollen, uh, whatever that little knobs are. That was probably avian pox is what that is called, uh, but they can go in any bird species, but they found it to be a, a more influence in raptors. Canada geese seem to be very susceptible to it. Uh, some of your swans. Colonial and, nesters. Yeah, a lot of colonial nesters. Andrew in North Dakota was seeing uh, die-offs of uh, uh, pelicans. White pelicans, um, eared greaves, egrets. But it impacts colonial nesters significantly, and it impacted uh, goose populations on the nesting grounds pretty strongly this year too. Didn't we lose some eagles too? We yeah, had we, we collected about eight eagles this year in the state, and everything from uh, turkey vultures to uh, a number of raptors that we tested had, had died from it. But uh, dabbling ducks, you know, your mallards and wood ducks, things like that, seem to be not resistant, but they. 
don't seem to be impacted as heavily as geese do, or and there were die-offs of scop in Florida this year, or this past year. Scientists are finding now wild biologists that of mammals that are getting it and niggling the paper. They're not the spreaders, though. So that's the plus side. But this whole field of wildlife health and diseases is paramount. A lot of state agencies, including us, are trying to put a lot more effort into monitoring the health of these things. And if anything, COVID put a fine point on us to do that because um, some of these animals we're seeing it with. SARS and COVID and white tailed deer, where it's most likely coming from people first. But so it, it's because we have been going on and on, but it's a, it's a really fascinating field that we've really got to have our game plan on to do it, to monitor the health of these things, especially the health for humans, the implications of what could happen to viruses and mutators and all of them through the pandemic. Questions? I'm just going to pass out kind of a, of a straw vote on the season. If I remember correctly, last year we did this entire uh, grouping as one batch and approved the whole batch. So if um, I can get a motion for somebody to um, bond these and then we can discuss for the fifth batch or whatever you want to make your motion as. Um, Let's make a motion that we vote on the entire batch. Second. I'll second that. Second. Any questions or any concerns with um, any of these as presented? Or any other comments? Just want to make sure these some of the slides have different data. Yeah, these represent the actual and accurate data. Yeah. Right. Have a different presentation next to Bob. Happens. And this this is basically we're asking your permission to present this to the public in the hearing. Right. This is just against the direction. Yep. Yeah, this and is the first it. vote, right? Well, we don't don't have to technically vote on it, um, David. But the there's really one vote, um, and that's the uh, when are we going to do the April fourth? The April meeting. Yeah, the board at the April well, meeting. Well, right. That's really, that's why this you know, is a straw vote. This is a straw yeah. vote. Got it. Yeah. Be helpful. I would really encourage if any board members have any real concern on any of our proposed recommendations. Bring it up now um, so we know um, to, to do that. It's just more helpful so that we are in unison that the, the public doesn't know what we're presenting. But we want to be together with you and we'd like to have that discussion right now. If any of those specific recommendations before you, um, you want you want to have some more discussion on or why we decided to land where we did um, on that. And I think we all sent you the waterfall survey. And actually, it was nice that last month that we had Dr. Uh, Mark Duda talking about surveying and polling. And to be very honest with you, we rely very heavily on that survey to what you have before you and took the more liberal opportunity for waterfall hunting here in Vermont, given that our impact on these migratory species compared to other states is quite limited. Is that accurate, David? Very, very, very limited okay. compared to some yeah. of our southern cousins. So Andrew, based on your presentation, it doesn't seem like there's much variation from last year. The meal two limits, bag limits, and then the few states and one way or another, but generally speaking, um, we're presenting the same package. Yeah, the only main the main differences are mallards going from two to four, uh migrant Canada geese going from uh one to three, and then Brant going from two to one. 
Okay, so there's a motion on the floor. No other discussion. Uh, all is in favor of uh, of this package of proposed rules, uh, rules or board seasons and bag limits, um, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? Okay, ayes have it. Thank you, Andrew. Aye. Getting the food ready for the good timing for the break. I'm going to make sure to let you remind you that the light is on here. Bill, um, during this, so just give you that info. Why don't we take a break to um, 40? Thank you. So, I just like, are you sure it wasn't a resume? No, I think it's not for a character. I'm
I tell you though, you just what I like. I used to know where I go. What's that? I used to go. Oh. Yeah, degrees up there, and um, I don't know what this would be right now. I just I know it was water starting to settle over the water. I don't know what kind of ice you guys saw. I was hearing slush, but it was like six inches of good ice. Yeah, so it was really easy to walk. We walked all the way to uh, yeah, yeah. inside there. I about saying you're never going to put another fish tip up. It's very in it. We quit around one thing. It's got that nice brown. That was in the back, the first when you first get to it. Yeah. That little tiny. Smell? Oh, the same. Oh, okay. Lakers are usually, yeah. Lakers are usually. Yeah. It's tough, right? Good. I'm starting to get nervous. <laughs> okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, next on the agenda, we have um, the 2023 moose season recommendation uh, preliminary approval. Uh, presented by uh, well, I'll turn it over to sure. Commissioner. Thanks. And, um, um, so those who weren't here last year, it's actually a treat I find listening to uh, Nick talk about this uh, the science behind what his group is recommending. Did you want to do the actual introduction? I want to just introduce the, the staff and the process, Commissioner. Thank That's you. all right. Um, so, oh, and, and more probably to the benefit of new members, I apologize for veteran board members are sick of hearing this, but the process in terms of this recommendation is this is a department recommendation. Um, this starts with Nick being the project leader, working with staff, goes with the big game team that we have, of which has board and services representation. I think it's really important to try to do it all. And then when their proposal comes up through, and I don't even get involved with that. Um, and then it comes up to me and then I share with the leadership team and the commissioner and others um, to that process um, where we go. And that's what you've got before you um, here tonight. I will say if you're a veteran board member, there should be no surprise the permit number. If you're new and you may say, whoa, you know, what, what's going on here? Because we're almost doubling the permits. But if I can recall the discussion from some board members, you folks were pushing. I said, why aren't you doing you know, if you've got this problem and you're not at your population goal threshold and you're concerned about the episodic effect of ticks, why aren't you doing be more aggressive? The nature, I think, as we've explained and we'll always explain, is when we deal with wild, I mean, this is not in Vermont, throughout North America, is we really take a very slow, conserver approach when we're talking about harvesting species to do that. And that seems to be just the way that all scientists work through North America to do it. We lived through the days where we took a different approach and that was in the 60s and 70s. And the result of that is when managing deer herd, if people remember that, our deer numbers were going up and down like this and our authority was taken away um, because we were taking an aggressive, hard approach. I think at that time, the director, Ben Day, was absolutely correct from a biological standpoint, but we hadn't done our work socially in trying to understand that we need to have more of a sustained, less dampened fluctuations in populations um, to do that. Because unfortunately, in those days, what happened is we lost our ability to control and manage white-tailed deer for a long time. Legislature took it over um, to do that. And, and fortunately, probably back in the 80s, we got it back um, to do that. So that's just so you understand. It's important that you understand that approach. Um, so I didn't did not surprise me a bit. I think David kind of alluded to me. I mean, well, Mark, you, I'm just going to tip you off. You might get surprised with the numbers and Nick. I appreciate it. I'm not at all. I think we're at the right place we need to be um, to do this, uh, of what we're going to have if we're, we're really truly going to manage, try to get a, a healthier moose population to be sustained the state. I want to introduce uh, just a little bit on the background on Nick, um, as I did with David. I think that's important. And, and 
Nick, you got a mind. I'm looking at some old notes I put together today, but but you also um, attended the Green Mountain Conservation Camp, and um, I got to know his father well before I even knew Nick, who was typical of many sporting organizations in Vermont, including the one you used to be involved with, my Pulteney Fishing Game Club. But they used to be so actively involved, I think they still are, supporting kids to go to Green Mountain Conservation Camp. And anytime I ever asked one of those organizations for help, whew, people would show up. And I remember meeting his dad up there, uh, building, I think, the, the, the water pump house that we had at that time at the camp with a whole bunch of folks. And just tremendous. And, and the sportsmen were so good at stepping up with that program. And today, I think it, it's a testament that for what sportsmen want to do to help help the youth. Um, Nick has a Bachelor of Science degree in Wildlife Ecology from the University of Maine at Orono um, in 2005. He went on to uh, study deer and moose in New Hampshire and got a Master's of Science in 2013. And between that, I'm assuming you probably worked for us, some as a wildlife technician, mapping deer wooden areas, um, things like that. Done quite a bit of research on moose um, before, more in New Hampshire than here. And then, like some of the other folks that you will see that get on the department, um, he spent some time out west um, working on bighorn sheep um, in Washington and Idaho, maybe for about three years. And um, his bachelor's of science, um, I should say, um, he also was, um, was a bachelor. No, that's wrong. I'm going to leave it at that. So, how many years have you been with the department? We lose track. Boy, it goes by so fast. Wow, that's hard. That's, that's a little frightening for me. How fast? It's like when you raise kids, you go, whoa, wait a minute. You like to set the clock back because it, it, it goes by fast. But I will say um, we struggle to find a good deer biologist to be a project leader in the state of Vermont. We went out three different times. We weren't the tourist two. We, were, we weren't happy with We landed on a candidate. We went to Michigan. But his spouse was making more money than him, and it couldn't work out to come. And I couldn't be more pleased when all of a sudden we were able to land on you, Nick, um, to come here and, and be our dear project leader. And, and I think you will see, for folks who have never seen Nick in his presentations, um, how lucky we are to have somebody um, to want to manage deer and moose. And in all fairness um, to Nick, I never thought we would be hunting moose later on until the research came along on our needs. So we never refilled the moose project leader. Nick graciously accepts both hats. Um, it's on my agenda, the commissioner knows that, to get Nick more help at some point um, to do that. But I also want to um, introduce, too, um, Dr. Katie Heater. Um, Katie, who will, you'll hear from here tonight, some of you heard before. Um, Katie is our, our, she introduced herself as our wildlife research manager. That was a relatively new position for the department. We're able to secure that position, in what they call PR bump, because of the huge gun sales that happened um, some years back, we got a big jump in our federal aid dollars, and we were able to argue to get that position on board. Um, Katie was is one of, uh, kind of a rare breed for us to have a position like that in our department. Other states around us have some, not all do. I know word when I um, when we actually hired her from my counterparts is they wish they had a Katie Geeter on their staff. And I think anybody who's heard her talk or present, you'll know why. Um, she's been a faculty member at Humboldt State University as a PhD from Virginia Tech, studying climate change and piping plovers. Um, that's interesting. And a master's in Trent University on shorebirds and a bachelor's of science at McGill uh, University. Um, she's been with us, I believe, since 2017. So five years, wow, time goes by fast. But um, anyways, these, I think it's important that the board knows the credentials of these folks that, that are dealing with this. Um, they're a godsend to me, I'll tell you that. Um, my science learning is was quite a long years ago and nowhere near um, what these folks can do. I remember struggling through statistics and the population ecology was a bear. Um, these folks live and eat and breathe and I, said, I don't wanna know anymore. I said, I'll trust you what you say, but but also they are the leaders in their field. I will say that with all certainty. And Katie works very closely with the University of Vermont faculty people even helps guide them in their work and actually even in their selection of new faculty when it comes on board. And I think when, of course, when you and I went up there and met with the University of Vermont Research a little while ago on the co-op, their annual meeting, they were singing her praises to us. Um, the, oh, thank God you have somebody like that that can make that connection between applied wildlife management and research that happens at these major universities. So with that, I've asked Katie to, to be here tonight um, in person. I appreciate that. Um, and, and to hopefully share some of the presentation with Nick. She works very closely with all of our species staff
to monitor the science, how we collect data, how we analyze it, so that we're in sync with the state of the art of knowledge that we have for research and management there. So, Nick, turn it over to you. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, I'm going to, because a lot of you are new, a lot of you will have seen this multiple times, but a lot of you are new more than normal. Um, I'm going to go into a fair amount of detail here on both our proposal and the, the science behind all this and the issue of, of winter ticks and moose. Um, this is probably a half hour anyway, maybe a little more of any talking. Uh, hopefully, y'all can stay away uh, for that. Um, before. Here we go. Technical it's her fault. So it's going to be longer than a half an hour. It's going to be more than a half hour. Just <laughs> try each of my girls. That's so, me. We'll have David Dean move. Now try it. Well, no, wait, no. That was me, not you. Okay. Yeah. No, okay, well, just give me the nod. But this is, did you just move it? Oh, it did, yeah. yeah this is it's not even at all. Can you unshare it and yeah. share it? Hold my hand on that. I like the old days where we had flip charts and I just could just read this way. <laughs> you could do that. Pictures are very important. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we're back. Okay. Before I talk about this recommendation, uh, quick summary of last year's harvest. Um, so last year we issued 100 permits, all in E1 and E2. Hunters took a total of 51 moose, 11 in the archery season um, out of 17 hunters, so 15 archery permits, two of the auction winners chose to archery hunt. Um, so that's actually the highest success rate we've ever had in archery season, ever. Um, the regular season hunters only took 40 moose. That either sex success rate of 55% is our lowest ever. Um, interestingly, in the regular season, we had the worst first day, opening day ever. 83 hunters took two moose opening day. And we had the best last day ever. So our best, our, our best take on that is is whether it was the warm weather at the start of the season or something, moose weren't moving, by what all hunters were saying. So something about moose activity really kept the kill down. Um, but we were we were at the low end of the range we predicted last year. Still, still within the ballpark. Um, okay, on to our recommendations. So the place we're gonna start with this is what are our goals? What are our goals and objectives for our moose population? As Mark alluded to, our overarching goal for moose is to have a healthy, sustainable population. To achieve that, we set density objectives or population objectives, um, in this case density, for each wildlife management unit. That's at a level we think will allow the population to be healthy. Um, some areas of Vermont, the, the kind of yellowish color on here, um, those areas we don't really consider moose range. There's a few moose that live there, but by and large, it's just not suitable habitat for moose in those areas. Most of Vermont falls into this lighter green. We have a, a density objective of 0 0.5 moose per square mile. That is a carryover from older um, moose management plans, big game management plans. We are currently reviewing that. Um, Josh Bluen, who is one of our moose researchers, now a specialist for us in Barrie, um, is looking at both mapping of what we consider to be moose habitat in the first place. Um, currently, it's all forest, regardless of how small that block of forest is. Um, but then also kind of looking, eventually looking into sort of habitat suitability. How many moose should we really expect there to be in some of these WMUs? 
I will pretty much guarantee you right now it will be less than 0 0.5 moves per square mile. Most of those WMUs have never ever had 0 0.5 moves per square mile. They've never reached that level. Uh, but nonetheless, that is our goal for now. And then in northeastern Vermont, we have this, um, it's a range objective, but generally right now, one moose per square mile is our goal. And those areas have had more than one moose per square mile in the past. The reason we set the goal there is because research tells us at that density, somewhere in that range of 0 0.75 to 1, we should reduce the impact of winter ticks and be able to sustain a healthy moose population. Yes. Um, so how are we doing in meeting those goals? Um, green bars here are our density estimates. Blue bars are the population objective. The orange line is the hunting threshold. So every WMU also has a hunting threshold set in our big game plan at 75% of the population objective. So in order to hunt moose, in order for us to even consider hunting moose, we have to be above that hunting threshold for two consecutive years. As you can see, we are well below that threshold everywhere except E1 and E2, which are a whole different world, well above not only just higher density, but well above our objective. So if we map out um, the distribution of moose in Vermont, so each dot on this map represents one estimated moose in the underlying wildlife management unit. Um, you can really see how much higher the density of moose is in E1 and E2. Most of Vermont just has much lower moose densities. Um, we're not recommending hunting there because those uh, those populations are low. Um, and there, there are a couple reasons why this is different, and I'm going to spend most of the time this presentation focused on E. So before I do that, I do want to touch on why we have fewer moose in the rest of them. Two major reasons. One of them, though, is brainworm. Um, so for any of you not familiar, uh, brainworm is a parasite carried by white-tailed deer. Deer evolved with it, doesn't cause them any harm, um, has kind of an interesting life cycle that involves a snail as an intermediate host, snail or a slug. Um, but if moose contract it, it's usually, if not always, fatal to the moose. So, as you might then imagine, areas with more deer have a higher prevalence of brainworm. Moose are more likely to contract brainworm in those areas. So, in areas with higher densities of deer, brainworm can be common enough that it limits the size of your moose population. Um, most of Vermont probably falls into that category where we have enough deer. That we're going that brainworm is going to be common enough to at least limit population growth, if not actually cause population decline. Um, but the other much more important factor, I would argue, is the loss or lack of young forest habitat. What percentage of white tailed deer? Uh, we've never looked in Vermont. Most of the Research I've seen puts it somewhere in the 60 to 80 percent range. Very common in white tailed deer. Um, so, loss or lack of young forest is really probably the bigger issue. Um, moose are very big animals and they eat almost entirely browse, so leaves and twigs of woody vegetation. Young forest provides a lot of browse. And therefore, the amount of young forest on the landscape really dictates how much food is available for moose. Most of our forests in Vermont look like the one on the right. They're relatively mature. There's very little in the understory. Um, so there's just not enough food to support more moose probably than we currently have. Probably one of the major limiting factors on the number of moose we currently have in most of Vermont. Um, so just to make this clear again, for the rest of this presentation, I'm only talking about wildlife management unit E, northeast part of the state where we have really high densities of moose. Most of what I'm going to say is not relevant to the rest of Vermont. Okay, so when people ask you something about moose in southern Vermont, most of what I'm going to say in the rest of this presentation does not apply. This is 
really focused on E, which is, is a whole different world. Um, so some history in, in WMUE. Um, in the early 2000s, moose population peaked in that area at somewhere between four and five moose per square mile. Um, there were way too many moose. So it's about the same time it peaked statewide, um, but very, very high density of moose in this area. Um, the population was intentionally reduced by the department. Um, I was a seasonal at the time and had no say in that matter, but um, I was working for the department. Um, population was intentionally reduced because of the impact moose were having on their habitat and subsequently on their, their own health. Um, so very high permit allocations brought the population down. 2010 was the last year of high permit allocations, last year of attempted population reduction. Since 2011, maybe 12, population has been generally stable. So for the last decade in E, we have had pretty much the same number of moose. Our estimates have fluctuated somewhat, but that probably has nothing to do with the actual number of moose. That's probably just error in the, in the estimate. But generally speaking, um, pretty much stable moose population for the past 10 years. One really important thing I want to point out here that I think is often lost. We have somewhere around 1.5 moose per square mile. I think it's 1.6 is the current estimate. That is a very high density of moose. Now, most people, that it's hard to get across because A, one or two are not big numbers. So when you say one or two moose per square mile, people are immediately like, well, that's not a lot of moose. But it is a lot of moose. The other thing that hurts us is most of us can remember a time in the not too distant past when we had a lot more moose. That doesn't negate the fact that we still have a very high density moose population in E. Kind of illustrate this a little further. Um, I'm going to show a couple maps from a paper uh, published a couple years ago that looked at moose densities across the range of moose in North America. Now the scale over there on the left is in moose per square kilometer. Um, I will translate that. Don't worry about that. Um, but this is all of moose range in North America. You can see the kind of higher density band um, that stretches across the continent. This next map just focuses in on that higher density population and adjusts that color scale. The red areas on this map are the only places in North America where moose exist at one moose per square mile or greater. That, zero, that red is basically one and above, um, if you translated that to moose per square mile. It's less than 7% of all moose range in North America do moose <coughs> exist at densities greater than one per square mile. So yes, we've seen higher densities in the past, but it is not normal. Is largely an artifact of having a whole lot of commercial timberland. Um, so we need to recognize that our current density is still a high density. So are, are all the carrying capacities per square mile different across those ranges, across those colors? Or are all those big carrying capacities different? Yeah, yeah probably. I mean, habitat quality is probably what drives most of that. Um, yeah, I mean, like. The, this northeastern bit, Newfoundland's a whole different world, but this northeastern bit in Maine, New Brunswick, in the Gas Bay, um, and New Hampshire and Vermont, that's probably driven mostly by commercial timberland. Really great moose habitat, right? Um, when you get out west, I don't know. I don't know what factors drive that. Might be commercial timberland, might be other things. Some of those you'll notice are very local. It's just one unit in a given state, um, kind of like what we have here. You'll also notice, despite what most people believe, moose aren't that abundant in most of Alaska. <laughs> um, they're actually pretty, pretty broadly spread out. Um, as we zoom in on New England, though, um, this is a, a different map. Um, this is the probability of moose occurrence. So not how many density of moose or habitat quality. This is just how likely is it that there would be at least one moose in a given area. Um, but this map does a really good job of highlighting what we as moose managers in the Northeast consider core moose range in New England. And that is WMUE in Vermont, Northern New Hampshire, 
and most of Western and Northern Maine. That area supports much, much higher host densities than the rest of New England um, for a couple reasons. Uh, one is it is the coldest part of the region, right? Moose are a northern species pretty much at the southern edge of their range. Makes sense they're going to want to be and do better in the coldest parts of the region. That cold also helps keep deer numbers down <laughs> those long winters and um, helps keep most parasite numbers down. Uh, moose evolved largely without parasites. So that colder temperature, not only do moose prefer it, but it does actually benefit them in, in terms of um, how well they do. The bigger factor, which I've always already said and alluded to, that area is almost entirely commercial timber. Right? It is logging is extensive and often intensive. It creates a ton of young regenerating forest which provides a ton of food for moose, but can support these higher densities of moose. There is enough food there. Uh, habitat is no longer an issue for us, even at our current density. But that density brings us to the winter tick. So winter tick is one of 14 species of tick in Vermont. Um, most of them you will never encounter. Right? Most of us only know two deer ticks and dog ticks. Um, unlike those, winter ticks have always been. Winter ticks have been here as long as we've had moose. Um, they're not, well, they are expanding northward with the climate change, but north of us. They've been here um, at least in the last century as long as we've had moose. Um, winter ticks are often called a moose tick because moose are really the only species they thrive on. You can find them on pretty much any large mammal, um, but they only really do well on moose. Main reason for that is that winter ticks have a fairly unique life cycle. Um, they're a single host tick. So most ticks, a deer tick, for example, is a three host tick. So it gets on an animal, typically a mouse or a chipmunk or something small as a larva, takes a blood meal, maybe picks up Lyme or anaplasmosis drops off, bolts into a nymph, finds another host, again, probably something small, um, takes a blood meal, drops off, bolts into an adult, finds a third host, mates, this third one's probably a deer or you or your pet, um, mates, takes a blood meal, drops off, lays eggs. That's most ticks. Winter ticks do all of that on one animal. And they do it over the course of the winter. So they find a host in the fall, typically September, October. Complete that entire life cycle, all three stages on that one animal over the course of winter, hence the name winter tick, and then drop off in the spring to lay eggs. A couple of reasons this is problematic for moose and not so much for other species. One is the questing period, what we call the questing period in the fall. So that's when the ticks are up on vegetation waiting for a, a host to walk by. That is in September and October, which is the rut breeding season for moose. Um, they're more active, they're moving around a lot more, so there's a much greater chance they're going to pick up uh, winter ticks. But it's not like moose are out there picking up one or two ticks at a time and they just pick up thousands of them because they're just constantly picking up ticks. Winter tick larvae come by the thousands. So unlike other ticks, winter ticks quest in larval clusters. So um, this is a cluster of questing winter tick larvae. And if a moose was to walk by, all of those would go. They would interlock their legs and they all go on the moose. Um, so it's not that they're constantly picking up ticks. They may only need to pick up 30, 50 of these clusters and then they have 30 to 50,000 ticks on them. Um, so that's how they can get a lot. The reason this is so problematic for moose and not so much other species is because moose are terrible groomers, right? Moose did not evolve with external parasites. They do not habitually groom themselves. Any animal that does habitually groom itself would remove the vast majority of these ticks in the six months that they're on this animal trying to complete their life cycle. And if they get removed in that time, it's winter, they fall off and they're dead. They don't complete their life cycle. So they have to have a host really sucks at grooming 
so that they can actually stay on there for the whole five or six months, right? Especially in that number. Moose will start to groom and rub all their hair off once they're already adults and it's irritating enough to them. They'll start to try to rub the ticks off, but by then it's too late and they're too well attached. So we know a lot about moose and winter ticks and how they interact because of research we've done here in Vermont, um, as well as other research, related research conducted in the region and, and across North America over the last several decades. Winter tick research goes back into the 70s, maybe even earlier. Um, but 2017 to 2019, we partnered with UVM captured and collared 126 moose in E, um, 36 cows, 90 calves. So we captured, we tried to maintain 30 cows on the landscape collared, and we captured 30 calves every January um, to monitor survival through the winter when they're covered in winter ticks. And then also for the cows, monitor um, birth rates and calf survival. So you know, how is it affecting? What we found is, about half of those calves. So these are seven to eight month old, month old calves when we're coloring them in January. About half of them died before spring, uh, mostly because of, of high winter tick loads, um, essentially um, anemia, blood loss. Um, winter ticks rarely kill adult moose. Though. They can in really bad years or really bad scenarios, um, but generally they don't kill adult moose but they do debilitate them enough that their reproductive rates decline and the calves they give birth to, um, keep in mind, moose give birth in May, most winter tick engorgement, like when they take that final blood meal and drop off is in April. The moose are trying to give birth a month after that happens. Um, those calves are often small um, and they have a lower survival rate as a result um, through the summer. Uh, I, I, I mentioned this, but we were not alone in this effort. So our study area was actually one of four in England. So what was happening in New Hampshire and Maine, we not only got a longer time period, but um, kind of a, a moose density and climate range. So Northern Maine has longer, much longer winters even than we have in Essex County. Um, and both of the areas in Maine have considerably higher moose densities than we have in Vermont or New Hampshire. Um, they're still in that four to six per mile range. And I will add uh, Quebec, um, they actually started in 2020, but the pandemic kind of messed with their research. But Quebec is now um, looking into moose and winter ticks in several areas in Quebec and, and um, one or two areas in New Brunswick as well. So this, this is expanding in the region. Um, Quebec's doing some interesting work with, with actually treating some of the moose that they're collaring for ticks, um, which not surprisingly, they survive real well when you kill all the ticks. Um, so we've learned a lot from that. And then I will add just quickly that um, we, are, we can't afford to collar moose every year. It's, it's costly um, and monitoring them takes a lot of resources. So. Our current focus, again, still working with UVM, is on um, a big regional project. We have a lot of partners, all the states, um, several other agencies and, and uh, organizations. Um, what is it, 14 partners, something like that now? Um, the focus, the main, the main part of this new research effort involves uh, permanent camera monitoring stations, so trail camera stations. Um, as a way to get additional information on moose, right? It's easy to get a lot of pictures of moose. Um, we're hoping this in areas where we're hunting moose, this will supplement the information we get from harvested animals. In most of the region where we're not hunting moose, this will provide us with some data on, uh, hopefully at least on moose health, and then ideally um, maybe give us some population metrics as well, help us give some trend in indication at least. Uh, I'm hoping this year, maybe we'll see some, some of the first results from this. Um, and see where it goes after that. All of this research collectively and all of um, the other research that has happened, again, this is relationship between moose and winter ticks is very well studied. Um, 
And there's one clear thing that has been found and proven repeatedly over all of these studies. And that is that the abundance of winter ticks is directly related to the abundance of moose. To illustrate that, um, this is a simple example, but I think it helps illustrate part, part of why this is. Um, in a high density scenario, so we have all these questing winter tick larvae or clusters, you now know, um, out there waiting for a moose, ideally a moose, something to walk by. If there are more moose on the landscape, there's a much better chance that one is going to walk by that cluster and those tick larvae are going to get picked up. Because there are more moose, they collectively pick up a large number of ticks, and therefore there are more ticks available to drop off in the spring, lay eggs, and start that cycle all over again. In a low, lower moose density scenario, even if we start with the same number of questing larvae in the fall, there's a much lower chance that those a moose is actually going to walk by those questing larvae. They're not chasing after moose. They're just waiting there. If nothing walks by for it, probably before we get consistent snow is probably what ends it. They're dead. That's the end of the game for them. So less chance those larvae get picked up because there are fewer moose, fewer total ticks available to drop off in the spring. So you have fewer ticks laying eggs in spring. If we played this out another year or continued this, there would be fewer questing larvae the following fall. Moose would have fewer, would pick up fewer ticks, um, be healthier going forward. This brings us back to this core moose range in, in New England. Um, you can find winter ticks on moose everywhere in New England. They, they exist. They actually pretty much exist everywhere in the United States, most of North America. Um, but the only place where there are enough moose to allow winter ticks to reach high densities that cause problems for moose is in this core range. There are just not enough moose outside of there to allow winter ticks to reach levels that are problematic, that are killing moose um, or severely debilitating. I'm not saying there's never been a moose in southern Vermont with 10,000 ticks on it. I'm sure there has been. I'm sure it's killed an occasion. But on a broad population level impact, it only happens where we have a ton of moose. The reason this gets a lot of press and has been a big issue for all of these states, even though it's a small part of the region, is because that's where all of our moose live. It's probably like 80 plus percent of the region's <laughs> moose live in that core area. So whatever happens in the rest of it really doesn't matter. Right. That's what drives our total regional moose population, what happens in that core area. So looking at um, health measures, how are we doing? This is ovulation rate. So this is the data we get when we collect ovaries from cow moose that are harvested. We, we require the hunters to provide us with ovaries when they check their moose in. Um, the data we get from that tells us how many calves that cow would have had the following spring. So essentially a measure of reproductive rate. You can see how this declined over time was pretty high in the 90s and early 2000s when moose were very overabundant, declined, and has generally remained low since then. Even though the habitat's now better, winter ticks are keeping this reproductive rate low. We may be starting to see an uptick in the last couple of years. Um, this is a three year rolling average, all of these. Um, this last year, 2022, we actually had a, I think our rate was 1.25, which if we could continue that every year would be fantastic. We'd be, we'd be set. Um, but we need to see some actual sustained improvement before I'm gonna say that we're actually seeing improvement. Um, but it is, um, I guess, encouraging, not discouraging. Um, So um, another important measure we look at with moose is uh, yearling female body weight. Um, so those of you that have seen enough deer presentations, in deer we typically focus on males. Um, in moose, we know enough about yearling females. They have a little longer time to maturity also, so this is important. But we really focus on yearling females with moose because we know that yearling females need to reach a 
this is a field dress body weight, but a body weight of about 440 pounds in order to ovulate. So in order for a yearling cow moose to breed, they generally have to be 440 pounds or more, right? Our yearling females currently are basically non-reproductive. Most of them do not reach a, a sufficient body weight to reach sexual maturity as a yearling. They typically breed the first time as a two-year-old. Um, this is really important because yearlings are a huge percentage. They're the biggest age group in your cow population. If you can get even half of them to produce a calf, that has a significant influence on how many calves are born in the spring. So this is really important and a really good metric of how your population is doing. Um, again, sort of looks like maybe we're starting to see an uptick. I wouldn't have any confidence in that, in that at this point, but if it continues, that would be encouraging. But we want to be consistently above 440 pounds, ideally. Um, Summer calf recruitment. So this is actually from our collared cows. Um, some of those collars are still working. Um, and we continue to monitor them. We can't monitor them as intensively as we did the first three years. Um, but in the last three years, we have checked on them in August to see whether they raised a calf or not. We don't know if they gave birth and lost one, but we at least know if they raised one through August. Um, and again, the trend here generally positive, right? We've seen a general increase over time. Um, there are a couple caveats to this, namely that it's the same group of cows, so they are getting older collectively um, and maybe are just more experienced, um, know how to find the resources they need, and so maybe that's why they're doing a better job. However, we also know that the three years when we intensively monitored moose, we now know looking back, that those three years were really bad tick years. We had we had pretty severe tick impacts. We lost at least half of our calves every one of those years. Well, not one of them, but um, close to half of them every year. Since then, 2020 and 2021, as far as we can tell, were actually pretty, I'm not going to say easy, but much reduced tick impacts in those two winters. Um, this past year was a little worse, but on the whole, this is probably more what we should expect, right? We're gonna have bad years, but we're also gonna have years that aren't quite that bad. Um, so initially we were basing a lot of our, our projections and everything on those three years of what turned out to be abnormally bad three years. In an ideal world, if we could redo everything, we'd have shifted our moose study. So we picked up one of these years when tick impacts were lower. So we could have seen that greater variation in tick impacts. As it worked out, we ended up with three really bad years. That's that's how it goes. Um, I will also add here, though, that in an ideal world, these are now all mature cows. They should be producing at least one calf each, in, in giving birth to at least one calf each, on average per year. So the fact that our recruitment is still only about point point six, whatever point six something, um, that's not good. We'd like to see this 0.8 or better anyway. Um, could be as high as one, really. If they're producing twins occasionally, this could be up near one. Um, so this could be better. Um, oh, yeah, I wanted to show. So I mentioned in this one that you know, we had a couple relatively easy tick years. This past year um, seems to have been a little worse. We got a few more reports of dead calves than we did in 2020 and 21. Um, we know also that tick impacts tend to vary across the region the same. So a bad year in Maine is a bad year here, maybe not to the same degree, but but climate has a lot to do with, with annual variation. So Maine lost 87% of their collared calves last winter. Um, we don't think we're anywhere near that bad here, but it was probably a, a worse year than the prior two. Part of the reason we don't think we were that bad here is if we look at the percent of yearlings in our cow harvest, and I focus on cows because hunters tend to avoid young bulls. So the percentage of yearlings in our bull harvest is pretty low, but it's always been low because hunters just avoid shooting those small animal bulls. Hunter chooses to shoot a cow or has a cow permit, they're not being picky, right? Cows stand in front of them, that's the one they're going to shoot. Um, 
So the fact that we're getting close to 30% year and a half old moose, remember these are the ones that were calves last winter. Probably didn't lose half of our calves if we can get that high a percentage of yearlings in harvest. So that tells us, even though it might've been a little worse, it wasn't real bad. Um, now we're not killing a ton of cows right now. So the error bars on this are pretty big, but, but I, actually, I actually find this quite encouraging that we're getting that high a percentage of yearlings. Um, okay, so we mentioned our goal is healthy moose. Saw so we're not quite there yet, right? Our, our moose aren't doing that great. Um, there's room for a lot of room for improvement, but our goal is to have some big, fat, healthy cows that produce twins occasionally, but at least produce some big, fat, healthy calves that can um, better survive whatever stressors come their way, whether that's winter ticks or some other parasite. Uh, want our moose to be healthy. That's the best chance for long-term survival. We don't want these thin, scrawny, thickly looking cows um, that struggle to produce calves. When they do produce calves, those calves are small and they can't really withstand, certainly can't withstand tick, the heavy tick loads we currently have, um, but there might be other stressors that come along. Like we want our moose to be as healthy as possible. And we really don't want to have half of our calves die every winter, right? That's that's not a good way to manage our moose population. It's not how anyone wants to manage our moose population. Um, you know, we've asked this question in surveys before. Most Vermonters would prefer that we hunt moose and have fewer moose to avoid having most of them die from winter ticks. This is not how we want to manage moose. I have to throw the slide in there because you know it all comes comes up regularly. The way to get moose healthy is to reduce the impact from winter ticks. We need to reduce winter ticks on the landscape. We cannot manage winter ticks directly. There is no currently viable way to treat a large percentage of the landscape or a large percentage of moose directly kill winter ticks. There is no way to do that. There is some research at UVM ongoing that we're cooperating with. Um, Cheryl Sullivan is leading that. I think some of you overlapped with Cheryl. She's a former board member. Um, her PhD actually looked at um, a fungal um, pathogen to kill winter chicks. Um, that's getting closer to being tested in the field, but even if it works in the field, there are a whole lot of considerations, um, not to mention it's probably never going to be viable or practical on a really large scale. Might be able to spray your backyard. You're not going to treat 600 square miles of WMUE for winter ticks. Um, the way we can reduce winter ticks is by reducing our moose population. We do that through hunting. Um, and that gets us to our permit recommendation. So our recommendation this year is 180 permits. 80 of those are either sex permits, 20 in the archery season, 54 in the regular season, and then the other six are the auction and special opportunity permits, which have their choice of season um, and WMU. So I know it came up, I think, at your last meeting, um, about the special opportunity permits potentially being able to hunt during the archery season. They can hunt during the archery season. They have that choice. They do have to use archery equipment. So the kid would have to use a crossbow, but they can choose to hunt the archery season if they feel that gives them a better um, opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. They cannot, by current rules, hunt during the archery season with a rifle. Antlerless permits, there would be 100 antlerless only permits all during the regular season. Um, and that breakdown of either sex and antlerless is necessary to get us to a roughly even split. It's a little heavy to cows, um, but a roughly even um, sex ratio, 50-50 sex ratio on bulls and cows. Our either sex hunters, particularly in the last three years, have been even more selective toward bulls, um, more than they were historically. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why that is, um, but regardless, we're basically 
planning that it's going to be like it was the last three years and those hunters are going to continue to avoid shooting cows so we have to have the antlers permits to ensure we shoot enough cows um the other tweak to this from last year aside from more permits is the last two years we've had a 60 40 split between e1 and e2 so 60 percent of the permits in e1 40 percent in e2 because of the higher density in e1 um, our current estimates are a little closer density wise so this is a 55 45 split um, so more of an increase in e2 than in e1 um, i did want to touch on this so many of you are probably not aware of our, our actual permit history as it looks long term so in this chart green bar is the number of permits we've issued this is only wme not statewide this is only e um, green bar is the number of permits we've issued the yellow bar is the uh, resulting harvest from those permits. You can see the seven year span when we were really trying to reduce moose numbers in the early 2000s. Um, otherwise, permit numbers have been have been pretty low. Um, you can see we tapered them off through the 2010s. Um, for those of you that are new, there were no permits in 2019. That was more of an administrative break to change some rules around um, mandatory permit allocations. So because we started issuing very low numbers of permits, and then we were required to give certain numbers to certain groups, um, that became problematic at low numbers. That is why we ha had no permits in 2019, not because our population couldn't handle a hunt. Um, since then, we've ramped it up a little, 55 in 2020, 100 each of the last two years, and then you can see the, the proposed number there this year. It would be the highest number of permits in E since 2010. As I showed you earlier, population has been stable since 2010. So it makes sense that we have to issue more permits than we have in the last 10 years if we're actually going to try to do something different. Uh, just to show you this again, um, whatever we've done in the last 10 years, we haven't effectively reduced moose numbers in that time. So we know we have to issue more permits than that. Um, also wanted to point out, you know, you probably noticed there that permit numbers declined to zero in 2019. When we were um, proposing that 2019 or 2018 recommendation, we only had data through, well, 2019 we would have had 18 data. But in the previous year, we would have only had that through maybe 17 when it looked like the population was still sliding downward, right? So that's why that permit numbers continue to decline and decline and decline. And then 2020, we started hunting again. We only had 2019 data, so that two years of sudden spike in our population estimate. We were ultra conservative because we knew full well that it's not possible the population was growing like that, right? So some part of that was was a mistake or not a mistake. But Variation in that data, in that population estimate. Which one is more wrong, more right, more wrong? We didn't know. So we were very conservative in 2020. 2021, when we upped it to 100 permits, we now had two years at that higher uh, population estimate. We were a little more confident that we were actually up at least well above one, um, actually up closer to that. So we were willing to be more aggressive, but we were still basing our projections going forward on our three years of when our intensive moose study was going on. So those three really bad tick years. So things looked pretty bad. Like we projected forward based on the birth rates and survival rates we saw in those years. It looked like the population was going to go down with any harvest. We're now at a point where we're pretty confident that that has all just been fluctuation in population estimates. And we've been somewhere around one, one six, where we're at now, one five. One and a half moose per square mile, about a thousand moose in E. Um, we're, we're more confident in that. Um, I would add that something that helps us get a sense of how many moose there are is um, the number of collared moose that have been harvested in the last two years. So hunters have taken 50 cow moose in the last two years. Two of those have been collared moose. We have about or had about uh, 25 working collars during that period, and another potentially 10, um, maybe even more than 10, 
either moose with a collar that was not working, so a dead collar, or moose that had dropped their collar but still had ear tags, so marked moose. So we know we had somewhere between 25 and 35 marked animals on the landscape. Only two of them got harvested out of those 50 moose. That gives us pretty good confidence if we work all the numbers out that our population will be right around 1,000, if that, that, that jives. Um, so we're, we're more confident in that estimate. Um, and the other thing that we're more confident in is our projection going forward. So we've had more years of data to look at. We've seen the bad years, we've seen the good years, and we can average that out. And our projections make sense with what we've, they now agree with what we've seen in the past decade. It would project if we continue to harvest about, we've been harvesting 50 the last two years, our average over the last decade is 40 moose per year, which has resulted in a stable population. Our projection, if we keep harvesting 50, was basically a stable population. Um, it would actually have declined by 1% per year, which is not a reasonable goal when we're trying to meaningfully reduce the, the moose, moose population. All other things equal, how many, well, how much would the moose population increase uh, if we weren't hunting? Is it going to be less than 100? If we, no, I mean, it's hard to say how far it would go, because at some point, if it increases, if it increases, pick and packs theoretically are going to increase and stop it at some point. Um, our projection right now is that it would increase, um, I think it was two or two and a half percent per year. Um, which is not rapid, but we would double, certainly double within the next 10 years if we didn't um, hunt moose. Again, pick impacts might prevent that from happening, but it would probably increase. Pick impacts would certainly not improve. But the goal is about 10% of the population taken, not, not permits. And, but the larger impact is the calves, correct? Yeah. But yeah, that might be worth. Yeah, no, I'm going to touch on. If you're getting there, I apologize. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that is a good point, though. Um. The the obviously, cow females are what drive the population, right? It's the number of females we kill. We could kill if we killed only bulls, it wouldn't really do anything other than really skew our sex ratio, which is problematic for moose. Um. So we don't want to do that. Um. But our current recommendation: 180 permits should result in the harvest of roughly 100 moose. Obviously, there's a fair amount of wiggle room in there. Um, and about 50 to 55 cows. <clears throat> that is about 10% of the overall population and 10% of the cow population. Cows are about half of the overall. Um, that will result in a decline of 5% per year. So. Killing 10% of your moose does not cause a 10% decline in your population, right? There are new ones made every year that add back some of that. So removing 10% of our population, if we do that every year and nothing else changes, right? Birth rates, survival rates, that all stays the same. We would decline by about 5% per year, reach our target population in E of about 630 moose, somewhere around 2030, which is the end of our current 10-year big game plan period. So this is our legitimate concerted effort to achieve our stated population objective in our big game plan by the end of our current big game plan. In an absolute worst case scenario, so we have three or maybe even four really bad tick years in a row, might get down to target by 2026. In reality, in the real world, we're gonna come back every year with new data come back to you and adjust our permit allocations and our harvest uh, accordingly. So we're headed in that direction. What we're trying to do right now is point the ship toward that goal uh, of being at target by 2030. Um, yeah, we can't continue to harvest 25 cows to get there to harvest more than we have been. Uh, any questions? I have a question. So you said if everything, even if the tick population doubled and it killed more of the moose, it, there would still be enough in the population to sustain the herd. So what if we had 
an additional predator that was reintroduced into the area, how might that affect the herd? Uh, um, honestly, I, I I would be hesitant to speculate, but I mean, if we had the only real predator of moose is wolves. Um, if we had wolves in a, we would probably have far fewer moose. Black bear, aren't they a pretty significant black bear predator. might kill an occasional calf? Yeah, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's yeah, it's it's not that common. Abs that. How big is a calf um, at its peak before it goes into the winter? And like, let's say during moose season. How, how big is a healthy um, calf at that point? A healthy calf is probably going to rest close to 300 pounds, so close to 400 pounds live weight. So is there any benefit? I mean, I understand taking the cows, and, and that's really the long term. Yeah. Most direct way to get to the population, but do, do we do you ever advocate for taking calves where we have such a high mortality rate of calves anyway? Yeah, so getting the cow and the calf at the end of the day, you're losing both. Um, that's not um, that approach has been has been suggested multiple times. Um, generally, it's not considered acceptable by most Americans, um, but uh, Scandinavia actually has calf seasons you can only shoot calves um because it allows you to harvest a lot more moose with with less impact on the population because a lot of those animals are going to die anyway over the winter um also they're not going to breed for several years so a lot less impact on the population and you can target a lot of moose i would not trust our hunters to identify calves now i know that sounds like how can you not identify a calf but if you haven't seen a lot of moose and you see a calf by itself standing there, most hunters are going to assume that's an adult moose because it's counting calf. Well, a count of calf together is easy. But a solo moose is it's a big animal to people who haven't seen a lot of moose. And the reason I ask, because I, I, I read that as well too, that Maine that they, they had collared 80 calves and they lost 70 of them last last winter. Some something close to those numbers. In the yeah, area. it was 80, 86 or 87 yeah. percent. Which just was just mind-boggling that they're still there. That that's that high a percentage. So I'm assuming, like you said, we may not be that high, but we're still closer to it than we want to be. We're still losing a lot. Like when we say we had reduced tick impacts, like that that could be 40% calf mortality. It's not good. It's just less than. It. Um, it, with the colored moose, have you seen any of the moose vacate E1 and E2? I know there's been I mean, for 25 years, a big chunk of B1 hasn't been commercially logged. So I would expect as it's getting older, it's no longer the best habitat. So I'd see moose going to New Hampshire. We have only had two animals leave the study area, and they were both long distance, um, I guess I would call it dis dispersal movements. Um, one went all the way to, to Faston, Waitsfield. Basically, and then went all the way back and ended up in New Hampshire, just across the river, um, and then dropped her collar. So we don't know what happened. To it. What would cause that? Most, some animals naturally disperse. Um, most of them might only go a couple miles, just out of their, you know, mother's home range. Some of them just get the itch and walk until they <laughs> feel like they've gone right there. The other one went to Gray, Maine, oh. almost 100 kilometers. Do you want to mention Elias's research that relates to his question the about the connectivity of moose and how often they may or may not move in and out of those areas? You are probably more familiar with that. So there is. Oh, not Katie, up near the microphone. Oh. Here. So there's a uh, there's some brand new publications that just came out regarding. Um, how moose move across the landscape that's been researched through their genetic connectivity. And basically the conclusion was that there's still, even in the rest of Vermont, not E, there's still really good movement of moose that is enough to maintain their connectivity genetically, um, genetic health wise. Uh, they're still really uh, in a good spot right now. So even if there isn't like we don't see a lot of movement. There's enough movement on the landscape currently that 
there's not a danger of moose vacating any areas and going to other areas like New Hampshire or anything like that. There's a well-connected moose population across the whole of the Northeast. But within the larger context, the issue is that genetically, they're very monotonic. They're, they're not very genetically diverse in the Northeast. So that does have to be taken into consideration because that makes them more vulnerable to that, that health effect that Nick is talking about, how we're so focused on moose health. That, that genetic vulnerability of them being not very diverse, it really factors in when you think about moose in 50 years. What is that population going to look like? Um, if their genetics are already not that diverse, um, then we really have to focus on their on their health because with climate change, especially all the other threats that they might face, you need to have the healthiest moose possible to give them the best chance. So, also to your point about habitat in E right now, um, one warehouser is doing a real good job of making real good moose habitat right now. Um, but you'd be surprised how many of our moose use areas where you would think would not be great, like West Mountain that hasn't been logged in however many years. Um, but it's because their home ranges are big enough that they can spend a lot of their time there and they will every now and then make a two day sojourn to some clear cut feed there for three days, two or three days, and then come back to their normal um, place and get enough food, I guess. Um, it, it has surprised me how many of our moose use what seems like not the best habitat. But our young ones, certainly the ones we call it as calves, they've all ended up in areas that are like great habitat now. So I don't know if it's a relic because those moose are maybe older and they have stayed in that area from when it was good and are still there. Um, moose live a long time. So. I have another question. So I know that these numbers are based on E1 and E2. There has seemed to be a growing population of moose in H given all of the um, logging that's been taking place there. So have you considered taking some of those permits and moving them to H? At this point, because of the way our goals are set and our hunting thresholds are set, we're not going to consider hunting anywhere else. Um, part of us addressing how we map moose habitat and estimate densities in other deming views is so we can potentially in the future address places like portions of H, H is entire. C is another one that, you know, when we look at it on the whole, density is not that high, but most of those moose are in a small part of that WMU. Um, and yeah, they, I mean, they could sustain a harvest. It's just a matter of how we set those goals and how we appropriately estimate all that stuff. And we're, we're trying to figure that out. But. You take a tooth like a deer to cage them. Yep. How long do they live? Um, moose regularly live into their teens. Um, bulls probably 12 is probably the high end. Um, our oldest cow was 22, not this year, but all time. Um, we regularly have, you know, cow moose, all us being equal, are going to make it into their teens if, some, if they don't get hit by a car or killed by a hunter. They, they live pretty long. It's impressive for a wild animal and the conditions yeah. they live in. Yeah, and that it, it's actually that is the reason why we can afford to lose half of our calves every year and have a population that would still grow theoretically. Because those moose live long enough, they are eventually going to replace themselves. They live long enough to actually get one to survive. Well, two, because they got to replace the bull too. But most of them live long enough to make that happen. If they were shorter lived, we would be in big trouble. But because they live so long, they do eventually get one. Are you noticing any any um, size difference on those older bulls? Or, you know, since our population has dropped so much over the last... It, it's really hard to judge much on our bulls lately. Um, because we had a few years of very minimal harvest, um, we've had, on average, our average age of bulls has been older in the last three years, like, um, I think some of the oldest average ages we've ever had. Um, I think it's a combination of a few years of very minimal harvest, so those older bulls are out there. And I think hunters nowadays have better tools. There's a lot more scouting goes on, a lot more trail camera use. So I think hunters are really doing a better job of targeting those mature bulls than they used to do. Um, so it's it's hard to say much about what's going on. With older but do you, do you take measurements of so? If the you got a bull moose. This bull moose is 12 years old. This one is 14 years old. Yep. 
mean, over time, do you know the average size, antler size of a 12 year old, a 13 year old, 14 year old? No, we, we group them all beyond four, we group them all together. It's so rare to get a bull that's more than 10, nine or 10 years old. We had this year, our oldest moose was a 12 year old bull. Uh, he was actually our heaviest regular season bull, 800 and something pounds. So he was still in good shape for a 12 year old moose. Um, his antlers were not impressive, but you, you expect that okay. kind of. Don't their antlers generally decline as they age? Beyond of? about eight or nine, they'll start to decline usually. Yeah. You know, they're, they're over the hill at that point. Question about the permits. Yeah. Um, the special opportunity for their, um, like, for instance, make a wish. Yeah. Things like that. Yep. And that increase that. Get more opportunity for those folks. Um, we ca I kept it at three because it's been at three. I know we have. Is it? I don't know what the statute says I on that. It's set by statute. I think it is. That's how many we can issue. Yeah, I think that's up to three by yeah. five. Yeah. Which the only change we did yeah. from the back for all the regulations is to also include the age. So it wasn't just limited to kids. If someone had a life threatening illness, I think we had to give kids. So 21 number. and younger. 21 and younger. Okay. Yeah. At least it's one of the permits has to be right. 21. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that one's limited to three by, by that, statute. I think Catherine, right. correct me, but I think that technically is the commissioner's decision, yeah. not the board, but we go we go beyond that and actually ask the board to support the recommendation so it's not it's not all said to the commissioner just the history it, it seems yeah. I, I mean i don't see anyone squawking i mean statutes can be changed but that requires going through the room yeah. so. and just another question out of curiosity how many applicants are there i believe last year um 7,000 and something, 7,300. Your odds are not good. <laughs> One year. I think I have, I have the maximum number of bonus points and I think my chance at a permit last year was, was 2%. <laughs> I only put in for either sex. Yeah, is it all right if I ask a question quick? Who's asking the question? Uh, Hunter, Hunter Cole. Uh, this um, is for, it, it, at this point in the meeting, it really is just for board okay. members. Sure. Thank you, though. There will be public um, hearings. Yeah, yeah, so yeah there, will, there, will be, there will be public hearings here in the near future uh, that oh. you can uh, bring. <laughs> okay, thanks. Also, an email. You can email the commissioner as well, too. Yes, it's because yeah. that's, that's right. right. That is the nature of Any other questions for Nick? <clears throat> okay, so. This, yeah, so I'm going to have you walk through that, Nick. Um, okay. So what we wanted to do was to set a main <laughs> verbally explain to the board learned something watching the fish folks do their presentations. Do it visual. So Nick puts us together, just much like the slide that uh, Andrew presented. But you want to walk us through the process? Uh, sure. So as Mark mentioned earlier, with waterfowl, whose permit numbers are set by procedure. This is not formal rulemaking. Um, so tonight we had my presentation. You guys will give preliminary approval, essentially, for us to go out to the public with this, or if you want to amend it, you could now and we would go to the public with that um then that opens the public comment period which will start tomorrow um press release we will we have our uh march deer and moose hearings scheduled um march 20th in orleans 21st in manchester 23rd in woodstock um we are not going to have a virtual meet hearing meeting this year we are going to put um I basically will record my presentation that will be available online so people are still going to be able to come watch the presentation all of the information will be online but we're not going to have a formal uh, virtual hearing where we walk someone through us showing them the presentation that they can view on their own so that's basically all we're going to do um, so that's that and then of course we'll take public comments by email and voicemail um, 
And then at the April 5th meeting will be the final vote, really the only one vote that matters on setting permit numbers. I have a question on the archery. What was the take of my crossbow versus traditional? I'd have to go look um, off the top of my head, though. I, I tell you, most of them were, were traditional vertical bows. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. I, I think our archery moose hunters tend to be pretty avid archery hunters. So, yeah. Um, yeah, they're pretty tired. But those hearings, uh, hoping we get good attendance from the board members, and we run those together. We'll do all logistics. Hope we'll take it. But I think it's really important for to get good board member attendance, and we will help walk you through how to facilitate table discussions. So we will run them like all the hearings we have, where everybody will hopefully feel comfortable speaking. Either you or one of our staff people on the same questions. I think I, I, I'm not sure if I heard you say something about. Did you say something about deer meetings as well, too? Well, so those March meetings are are, are deer and, deer and, deer. And, and so at our March meeting board meeting, we do will give us a presentation. I will not be a March board meeting. <laughs> okay, fingers crossed. I won't be no. there. <laughs> It'll be April. Yeah, April. Late so there's April. there's two in April, two meetings in April. Early one is the vote on this. Late April is the antlers. Okay. And then there will be two additional deer meetings in May. Okay, um, so we're not doing the right. we're not doing the public hearings. The public hearings will be just to discuss the moose on no. moose and deer. So we we have, have to do by statute five public hearings on deer, and three of those public hearings can be on moose. Yep. And we traditionally most of the have they always have been referred to as the March hearings. Yep. What we're doing is looking to get information from the attendees on their thoughts and any information they could share with us on deer and moose. Okay, so we're we're doing the deer kind of the No, we've always done it this way. Um, no, I know, but just from from, from new so we're doing two more there. later. Yep. Once the board gets preliminary approval on the permit number. So hunters have something to react to. Yep. I can tell you, we've been doing this for a long time. We get very low attendance later. They 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 want to, you know, we could say we're going to issue, I don't know what number of permits. We we get the same comments almost every year from folks, but they it's it's a system that's set up that way. When we go to you with our recommendations in late April, you will see all the comments that we've picked up on deer along with our recommendations. Are these evening meetings or afternoon meetings? They're all evening meetings. I think they'll all be 630 start. Like 630. Yeah. Okay, so you're looking for a preliminary approval from us on these recommended permits. Thank Mr. Chairman, you. if I could. I'm now, sorry if I'm. I've gotten confused about this, but um, these hearings will be both moose and deer. Is that correct? So this is the way I understand it, David, and then correct me if I'm wrong. So for the moose, we are giving a preliminary approval prior to the public hearings. At the public hearings, the department will also be taking public comment on deer and then after the public hearings they will come to us with their with their recommendations after getting some public uh, information and then okay so the, the, the three meetings in march are specifically scheduled as moose meetings but comments on deer will be accepted no they're, they're scheduled as moose and deer hearings Moose, okay. And that's the way we've done, and that actually was um, legislatively done and approved for us to do it. Right. So that way, to this process. So we'll have questions on both. At yeah, these three so we hearings. are required, as Mark said, we are required by statute to hold five public hearings annually on deer. In the interest of not having 16 public hearings in March, yeah. we combine our three moose hearings and three of the deer hearings. Yeah. Oh. But it'll be two. Okay, thank you. Later. Gotcha.
Okay. So I will make a motion that we adopt and move forward with the recommendations for uh, move signing permit allocations for 2023 for WMU E1, E2, uh, 20 either sex archery season permits, 54 either sex regular season permits, 100 candidates only regular season permits with three option opportunities and three special opportunities for a total of 180 permits. Second. Motion and second. Any other comments? Repeat that <laughs> <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion is presented to by saying aye. 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 Have it. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Nick. Okay. Uh, next, we have um, the commissioner's update. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I have a recommendation for Nick. He should change the presentation's title to TikTok. Oh, sorry. Um, I guess the first thing I I did want to mention, in all seriousness, is you once again get to witness um, a, a snapshot of the expertise of the folks that work uh, for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, it, it's truly amazing, no matter what the issue is, the level of professionalism, the depth of knowledge uh, that they bring every single discussion. Um, and this is, for me, this is like being in a master class every day, um, just trying to keep up and learn. And so uh, I want to thank everybody. And it's it's truly inspiring to watch you work on a daily basis. Um, this week's been a little bit tragic um, for the uh, fishing community, as you may be aware. Uh, we had three uh, ice fishermen go through the ice and die uh, all up in Grand Isle. Um, and so as a result, um, we worked with the sheriff there was an ice fishing derby and we asked that to be canceled and they agreed immediately. And uh, Josh, our public information officer, worked diligently with me to craft a message uh, to get out to everybody advising that they should avoid the ice on Lake Champlain. Um, apparently not everyone heard this because this evening Jay was late rescuing an ice fisherman in Georgia off Lake Champagne. Um, yeah. The ice conditions haven't gotten any better. In fact, they deteriorated. Um, and so our message is generalized to any body of water, but it's always been our message that if you're going on the ice, you should be checking the ice, uh, whether it's with a spud bar or whatever. Um, and I know that Allie's been doing a lot of public work uh, information work on that, but has since the beginning of ice fishing season. So, if you know anybody who ice fishes, um, I think the best quote I've heard is from the Colonel who said, there's no fish worth losing your life on. So, um, my glass is on. The next month will be a busy meeting. Um, we'll be working in the intervening time on finalizing our recommendation from the department to you with respect to trapping BMPs and the uh, coyote uh, hounding legislation. And so because we haven't finalized that, the BMP uh, report has been issued. I think you've all have it. You've probably read it. Uh, it was issued to the legislature as well on time. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the particulars right now because some things might change between now and the, the official presentation to the board, uh, but we'll make sure you have that information and be able to answer questions at that time. Um, the wardens, I wanted to update. Uh, we have three, I swore three new wardens in weeks ago and they started, I believe, this past Monday, previous Monday. Uh, at the police cap. So now they begin the long journey, which coincidentally uh, 
we got to witness on Tuesday, or was it Monday? Monday. I'm so sorry. It's been a week. <laughs> Monday morning, we took the three who went to the academy last time and have finished their field training. And we took all the field training officer wardens and we went over and the governor congratulated them on finishing their training. I mention this because uh, I like to highlight that of all the law enforcement agencies in the state, um, the wardens go through a the most rigorous training after they get done with the police academy. Um, they work with our biologists. Uh, they work through all the seasons. Uh, they go out and they encounter all the different things that they're likely to see uh, so that they can go manage it on their own. And so those three folks have done that. Um, and the warden service remains unique, and I intend to keep it that way, in that they are completely integrated with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, you know, I've talked about Jackie Como going out on bear incidents with a warden. Uh, there were wardens with me on the shore on Sunday, a Saturday, uh, when the locals were pulling you know, the two fishermen out. They are part of their community and they're part of the department's community. Um, they're here at this. They were part of the working groups um, for the two bills that we're going to talk about next month. And so uh, they have taken on a little bit of extra work um, and that was uh, recognized by the governor. I want to recognize it again uh, because I know it's it's a lot of work for them and they don't complain. They do their job and they do it well. And by the way, I think they look better than any other law enforcement. And they wear the red coats. And so um, I wanted to publicly acknowledge their work because uh, sometimes they get forgotten because they do such a great job. You don't read about them in the press. And that's a good thing. So that's pretty much I, all I have except. I don't know if you want me to mention it now, but it's somebody's last board meeting. Oh, man. Um, six years is a long time, I imagine. Um, you've seen a couple of commissioners, board chairs, a lot of activity. And so. Changing of the guards with the uh, biologists. Yeah. <laughs> so even though it's your meeting, I'd like to ask you. Uh, I'd like to give you the floor for a few minutes. Sure, thanks. Talk about your experience, but also on behalf of the department and the people in the state of Vermont, thank you for your work. Thank you. Uh, you know, I came on six years ago, and uh, it was uh, for all the people that are new. The first couple of years seems like you're you're trying to learn your way. Third year, you kind of seem to get it a little bit, and then fourth, fifth year. You kind of have it down and then next thing you know, you reach your six year and you're done. So uh, that's about how it goes. Um, you know, I came in thinking I knew a little bit about some animals, you know, the ones I was passionate about, obviously turkey and deer. And, uh, and it was privileged to be able to see the biologists work. They are all of them are very impressive. Uh, you know, no other career can I see that you see that I other than maybe a, a doctor who makes a lot of money, <laughs> you know, well, the biologists don't seem to make a lot of money. Um, they have extensive degrees and a ton of experience just to get in the door. And uh, it's super impressive. You know, Kim Royer, obviously, she's now retired, but uh, to learn about fur bears, I didn't know anything about fur bears when I came in. And that uh, that experience was you know, fantastic to hear. Uh, the fact that I didn't have to pay for a degree and I learned just a smidge for free. Uh, I do uh, greatly appreciate that from all the biologists. Uh, and it, it goes by fast, um, a lot faster than I realized, you know, uh, but uh, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm, it's a excellent experience that I'm glad I got to have. And I'm just very thankful that uh, I got to have that experience. So, and thank the department too, it's been fantastic. Appreciate it. Well, I'd just like to say thank you too, Dave. That's, as, a, someone, as a member who was uh, going through those first two years, <laughs> uh, you know, you look to, you know, how some of the other members kind of conduct themselves and, Kind of operate around you know the board meetings and so you were always one of the ones that i looked at because i saw how you conducted yourself during some of the meetings and some of the more um i think involved discussions with the public and so it was a good um because you were a good mentor in that way you know so to speak and so i appreciate that and um 
and I don't know if anybody else knows, but every time that I kind of look like I don't quite know what's going on, I always kind of look over towards Dave and, you know, and just kind of gives me some kind of indication of, of where to head. So uh, I'll miss that, and I appreciate, you know, what you have offered. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, so let's uh, go around the table, the round table. We can start with Jen. 